This is Tales from the Break Room, a podcast featuring scary true stories from the places people work. If you have a scary story from your job and you want us to narrate it on this show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit, or check out some of our other scary podcasts at eeriecast.com. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Well, it's spooky season again. And we've been absolutely selling out of pumpkin lice lattes as usual. What? Yes, that's what I said, pumpkin lice lattes. They go down smooth until they start to feel itchy around your inner throat hair, you know. Anyway, now's the perfect time to retell my favorite ghost stories I've shared with you so far. Enjoy and try not to overdose on fake pumpkin juice and caffeine. These are tales from the break room. College Night Shift from Eva Fan 33 I used to work part-time at the college where I studied. I took courses in the IT field, and each semester they would hire some students to work entry-level tech positions, granting decent income and great experience. Being one of the lucky few to get a job, I didn't complain when I was rostered over to the night shift. My role was a lab proctor. Usually, I was tending to computer labs, re-imaging workstations, and installing new ones. The reason there was a night shift at all was to service the instructors teaching part-time courses. There were only a few night classes, sometimes none at all, but even so, if something went wrong, we had to be there. Otherwise, a class might end up cancelled. I only had one partner in the evening hours, a girl named Kira. I was fresh out of high school and she was a few years older than me. But we got along well, similar senses of humor and all that. Things were pretty seamless for the majority of the term, until we hit the first day of December. I'm going to recount it to the best of my ability. Hopefully you don't mind the details, but I want to go as in-depth as possible. So I met Kira in a laboratory on the third floor of one of the campus buildings. I'd come early, but she was already waiting for me. This was the default location for the proctors, Usually, we didn't spend much time there. We would just set our stuff down and then go follow up on tickets or jobs that were sent out. Our boss, Harry, wasn't there that night. Not like we really needed him anyway. He'd sent out an email beforehand informing us that he was not available, and he'd attached tickets we had to work on. There were five or six of them, and we had from 4pm to 12am to finish them up. The first one was to re-image a lab, this meant we would be installing an operating system on each computer in a certain room. The lab was in another building. It was a large campus, and the place we'd need to head over to was about a six-minute walk. Whenever we went out, we were supposed to take proctor phones with us. They were normal smartphones, the key difference being they had the instructor helpline forwarded to them. It was essential we carry them around to answer any call that might come up. That's why I found it weird Kira didn't take hers. She seemed to forget, so I gave her one and grabbed the other, also taking my laptop with me to update the inventory of the lab. Odd things began to happen when we stopped in the elevator. I punched the button for the ground level, and the doors closed. But before the elevator started, the two of us heard this scratching noise. That's the best way I can describe it. It sounded like an animal, maybe a raccoon, dancing on the roof of the elevator with its nails grazing the metal. I knew for a fact the sound wasn't there when I'd gone up, so I was sure it wasn't the hardware of the elevator. I made a comment about it. Kira seemed indifferent, though. In fact, she was awfully quiet. Anyway, the elevator reached the ground level without issue, and we got out. The exit was right in front of us then, and we headed through. From there, we started our walk to the building that housed the lab. The sun had already began to set, it was the middle of winter, after all, and it was chilly. After another few minutes, we got to the building. The doors were automatically locked at 4pm each day, so we needed to swipe our access cards to get in. Despite the smart security on the door, this building was a lot older than the others. The air conditioning seemed defective. It was incredibly hot and muggy when we entered. The lab in question was on the bottom floor of the building, so we took the stairs to get down. Once we made it to the lower level, we were greeted with a hallway. It was dark and rather ominous. 
Even worse, the lights were buggy. Only the one directly above our heads came on. The rest in the hallway started to flicker. Almost all of them were spotty and inconsistent, except for the one at the very end, which didn't turn on at all. We didn't mind terribly, though. There was enough light to make out the room designations. The lab we were looking for was right in the middle of the hallway. We walked up to it, and Kira swiped her card to open it up. Only nothing happened. The card didn't seem to trigger the reader at all. It didn't spit an error, it just ignored it. So I swiped mine, and the door opened up. As we got into the room, we noticed something bizarre. One of the computer chairs, the one at the far corner of the room, was spinning. Quickly, too. It was like someone had just slammed it as hard as they could. No one else was there, though. Even weirder, inertia should have slowed down the chair, but it just kept spinning, like its velocity was continuously being refreshed. We both looked at each other, then I went over to it, freaked out but trying not to show it. I grabbed the chair to stop it from spinning. It froze, but as it did, this sensation of ice crept over me. It was like when you swim in a pool in the middle of winter, then get out and feel the exposure on your skin. Only it was just on my arm. I must have freaked out a little, cause Kira asked me if I was okay. I said I was fine, and then the sensation went away. Like there one second, gone the next. After I recovered, I was going to make a comment about the chair, but she had already gotten to work so I didn't bother, instead following her lead. It seemed to me she was having a rough night, because she fumbled with the keyboards, apparently forgetting how to open up the boot menu. So I took over her machines for her. It wasn't hard work after all. She sat down and watched me, looking very tired. It took about 15 minutes to begin the imaging process on all the computers. I read over the next ticket. It involved pulling up a workstation in a different lab back to the proctor room to diagnose it, because it had some hardware issues. I checked with Kira to make sure she was okay staying in the lab by herself. She didn't have a problem with it, so I left. I did feel uneasy about her being alone, though. I didn't really know why. Something bothered me about it, but I knew it would be redundant for both of us to wait there. So off I went. As soon as I stepped into the hallway and shut the lab door, the scratching sound returned. It was right over my head then, in the ceiling. The exact same sound from the elevator in the other building. I could hear it more clearly without the noise of the cables moving up and down. It sounded less like a raccoon and more like a dog. There was some weight to whatever creature was making the noise. It seemed to be digging, furiously, as if it was trying to get through the ceiling. I tried to ignore it and headed down the hallway, but the sound followed me. Every fluorescent light I passed turned off, like whatever was making that sound up there was cutting the wires. Paranoid, I sped up and eventually reached the end of the hallway. The noise followed, and quickly, it cut off the very last light. Freaked out and a little frustrated, I yelled something along the lines of, Enough! And just like that, the noise went away, as if it was never there. I was really anxious at that point. I think I tried to rationalize it as I passed living between levels of the building. Just as I was about to take the stairs up to the ground level, though, I remembered Kira. My stomach dropped as I thought of her. It was the same feeling of uneasiness. Not necessarily for her safety either, I just felt strange. It's hard to explain, but anyway, I ran back down the dark hall and opened the lab door to check on her. To my dismay, she was gone. The chair she had been sitting in just before was empty, but now it was spinning rapidly just like the one from the first time we entered the room. I didn't know what to do. I was beyond freaked out. I spun around, pale as a ghost, when I heard the door to the lab unlock. Lo and behold, it was Kira. She was fine, apparently, even smiling, unlike when I had saw her previously. Then she asked me a confusing question. Hey, why didn't you wait for me? I blinked, confused. She told me that she had arrived in the proctor room to find it empty, with me and the phones already gone. She had to look up the first ticket to find out where I was, and then she came and found me. I just sort of stared. I must have given her this look because she was like, what's wrong? 
Then I explained to her that I had met her earlier that shift and we headed to the lab together. She looked at me like I was stupid. She iterated again that she had been late and had to look up the room to find out where to go. I think I snapped then. I said something along the lines of, if this is a joke, it's not funny. She asked me what I was talking about. That's when another realization set in. When you're in some freaky situation like this, you don't sweat the small stuff. You don't take in every detail. So I only realized then that Kira was wearing something totally different than what I'd seen her in before. There were two possibilities. Either this was some elaborate prank where she left, changed, and came back, all the while messing with the lights, or there was something really bad going on. That's when I decided to check. I told her that she had taken the proctor phone and she insisted she hadn't, saying both phones were gone by the time she'd gotten there. So I took out my own phone and called the number of the proctor phone she had, fully expecting it to ring from her pocket. But it didn't. The dial tones played, but the device itself must have been too far because we didn't hear it anywhere. Kira looked at me, annoyed, and I was about to apologize for accusing her of lying before I was cut off. Someone answered on the other side of my call. I heard nothing at first, but the dial tones had stopped and it didn't reach voicemail, so I knew someone had picked up. Immediately, I put the phone into speaker, mouthing the word, listen, to her. We both stood there silently. As I turned the volume to max, we picked up on a noise. It sounded like breathing, faint but audible. Someone absolutely was there. Kira, who wasn't half as freaked out as I was, decided to say something. Hello? Immediately after she spoke, the breathing stopped, only to be replaced seconds later by this heaving, like laughing but dry, almost silent, the only noise coming from the diaphragm changing shape. It went on for 15 seconds. We both listened, wide-eyed, before the call dropped without warning. The other person had hung up. Kira took the phone from my hand and called back more than once, but whoever or whatever it was did not answer again. I wish I could say it ended there. I want to tell you we decided to pack it up, call it a night, and leave after that, but we didn't. Kira was headstrong, convinced it was some prankster messing with us, and I, scared as I was, wasn't going to leave her alone. So we kept working. Maybe two hours later, we finished up the first ticket in the lab, finalizing every install, then moved on to the second, hauling a computer back to the proctor room. Everything was good for a while. After we got the machine in the door, Kira said she was going to use the restroom. It was only a few doors down, so I didn't raise an issue. I nodded at her, moving the computer into the room to hook it up to a monitor and began diagnosing what was wrong. When I got to the desk, though, I jumped. On the table was the missing proctor phone, the one that we had called. It was just sitting there in its usual basket. I know for a fact only me and Kira were on duty. No one else should have had access to that room and she hadn't left my sight until we got there. So how in the world was it here? Suddenly the door to the room slammed. I'd left it open so she wouldn't have to swipe to get in and it slammed hard. I knew someone had pushed it. Now focused less on fear and more on my coworker's safety, I got up, running over to the door and yanking it open. I was met with a dark hallway, like totally dark. The overhead lights that were up 24-7 were all offline. The only reason I could see at all was because of street lights seeping into the mini glass panels of the building. Focusing, I turned my phone's flashlight on. It was pitiful in the huge college hallways, but it made them walkable. I called Kira's name. There was no response, so I began walking to the restrooms. On my way, I passed by a classroom and the door creaked open as I walked. It was so eerie, slow and drawn out like a horror film. I found it impossible that a door like that could have been so terribly lubricated. Regardless, I continued on. The washroom was just up ahead. I used my phone to identify which of the doors were for women. It was held open by a door stopper, so I entered. 
I called Kira's name again. Still, no reply. I felt a little weird about going into a female bathroom, but given the circumstances, I really had no other choice. Shining my light around the room revealed no one. It was small. I could see almost every corner, and Kira was not there. The only thing amiss about the room was the stall door. It was swinging back and forth, making no noise at all. Just like the chairs from before, it showed no sign of slowing down. I remember being mesmerized by it, standing still to watch it glide. I was snapped back into reality from the sound of footsteps in the hallway. Immediately, I shot back out, calling for Kira again. By the time I'd exited the restroom, the footsteps were already down the corridor and behind a corner. It sounded like the other person, whoever it was, was running. So I ran after them. It was like something from a cartoon. No matter how fast I ran, they always stayed a little ahead of me. I could never quite reach the person, but I was always close enough to follow. I was led up and down stairs, down all sorts of different hallways until finally, it stopped. I was huffing and puffing as I turned past the last corner. There was only one door there, and it was ajar. I recognized it as one of the School of Health classrooms. I caught my breath, now irritated that I'd been led around the school. Then I walked up, shouldering the door open. The room was entirely dark. I reached over for the manual light control, flicking it up. It was able to override whatever had kept the hallway lights off, and it turned on illuminating the room. Oh man, I wish I didn't flick the light switch on. There were skeletons. I don't mean real skeletons. It's one of those models you've probably seen in science classrooms. About the same size as a human one, but made out of plastic or some composite material. Anyway, in every single chair sat a model skeleton. They were all turned to face me. It was horrifying. Who the heck had set up all these, and when? As I took a step backward from them, there was an ear-splitting noise. I blinked, and every jaw fell off the skeletons in unison, clacking to the floor, like they were all severed off. There I was being stared down by an army of jawless model skeletons. Right away, I noped out of there. As I ran, I could have sworn I heard plastic joints cracking as if they were pursuing me. I took the nearest exit, pushing out of the building into the cold night air. I remember taking a minute to catch my breath and process what the heck had just happened. I wanted to run, so badly I wanted to run, but Kira was still in there somewhere. She wasn't picking up her phone. I even called our boss Harry, but he didn't respond either. At that point, I was fed up. I think I was going to call the police, but was trying to work out how to get across my story without sounding insane. Then, something caught my attention. I could see a shape moving but not very quickly. It was very timid. It was obviously a girl. Kira. Even in the low light, I knew it was her because of the short crop of her hair. She walked out of the shadow and onto the path. It was so weird. Ten feet away, she faced away from me, dead center in the middle of the walkway. I remember calling out to her. I wasn't thinking. If I was thinking, I would have known something wasn't quite right but I was too worried about her and too glad to see her again to be careful. I said her name, and then she started heaving. Facing away from me, she was doing this convulsive motion, like she was hysterically laughing. Only there was absolutely no sound coming from her, none. It went on for minutes, the same horrifying movement. I backed up, slowly to the door I'd exited from, automatically swiping my door and pushing on through. When I turned back only a few seconds later, she, if you can call it that, because it obviously wasn't Kira, had disappeared from the path. As soon as she was gone from my view, the lights turned back on. The entryway of the building was illuminated once more, as were all the hallways. I could move about again without my phone's flashlight. Very carefully, I headed upstairs as quiet as I could, then to the proctor room. My plan was to grab my stuff and book it out of the building, calling the police on my way. Quickly, I swiped the card and shouldered my way into where my backpack was. Kira was waiting for me. She had the computer we'd brought on up on a table with its side panel off. She was busy working on it. She didn't even turn her head to me, only saying something like, 
Oh, hey. I was so glad to see her, the real her, that I ran up and hugged her. She asked what the heck I was doing, and I told her I'd gone searching for her when the lights shut off. Before I could ramble about the person running through the halls and the model skeletons, and the other version of her that was doing that heaving thing, she cut me off. She told me that when the lights shut off, she left the bathroom and came back to the proctor office to find me. Apparently, she began working on the computer, and I mumbled something about completing another ticket before I walked out of the room. And after that, despite her protests, I made us pack everything in. We grabbed our things and left, Kira complaining the entire time. I never gave her a real explanation. I couldn't. I just needed to get us both out of there. That's really it. I'm sorry for the length of this story. I wish I could give some detailed explanation or round off with some cliche about seeing a silhouette standing inside one of the buildings as we left, but I can't. It ended as quickly and strangely as it began. The only reason I remembered this story is because Kira hit me up recently. We hadn't seen each other since the beginning of the Rona thing, and she wanted to reconnect. We planned to meet up next weekend to get drinks. In her text, she joked about finding out why I made us leave that night. I thought drafting this up might help me find the words to explain it to her, if I decide to explain it at all. As for what entity or phenomenon was in motion that night, I haven't a clue. Maybe someone out there does know, though, and will heed my story as a warning. I do know that whatever it was sincerely enjoyed freaking me out, though. Take that how you will. Good luck on your night shifts, everyone, and stay safe. The Wandering Man from Anonymous I work in a large manufacturing facility. There are around 3,000 or so people that work here on different shifts. There is a select group of us that get offered overtime on the weekends, but the majority do not, so the buildings are all empty. One weekend, I was working the night shift and didn't have much to do, so I got bored and decided to take a walk around. Man, how I wished I wouldn't have decided to take that walk. I went walking through the other buildings that were relatively dark, with only the occasional motion light coming on here and there. So I'm wandering around getting bored again and decided I'll go to the cafeteria to grab a water from the vending machine. Once I get to the vending machine, it's out of waters, so I decided that I'll go to the cafeteria in the other building. There's a hallway between the two buildings, and for some reason there's not any lights that come on when I'm walking through. So at that point, my only light was coming from the red emergency exit sign. I can see well enough, so I walked on through, and as I'm getting into the other building, I noticed it was pitch black. Here, there were no lights coming on, and I couldn't see anything. I pulled out my phone for the flashlight and decided to keep going through the building. I got about halfway through the building, then my phone died, so now I was just standing in the pitch black with no light. As I'm standing there trying to figure out what to do, I began to hear a voice. I couldn't make out any words, but I could definitely hear someone talking. I thought this was someone on maintenance coming through to look at something. I yelled out into the dark, Hello? And I got no response. My voice echoed through the building, as if I were on top of a mountain yelling out. Panic began to set in as I realized I'm stuck here. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a dim red light. I thought I'd caught a glimpse of an exit sign illuminating my way out. I started to try to slowly make my way over to it. Then I hit my shin on something. As I'm standing there holding my hurt leg, I realized that I should be too far into the middle of the building for there to be an exit sign anywhere close. I started to look for the red light again. I couldn't find it. It was like it had disappeared. Frantically, I tried turning my phone back on, but no luck. I began moving very slowly in the direction I thought I last saw the light. As I shuffled my feet, barely moving, I heard a voice again. Except this time, the voice was close enough to hear what it was saying. I stood terrified because I thought the words had said, This will be your eternity. I panicked and I began to yell out, Who's there? But again, I heard nothing. Then I caught a glimpse out of the corner of my eye of the red light again. 
except this time, it was in the opposite direction of where it was before. I went ahead and started making my way to that light. Somehow I managed to get back to the dark hallway I'd walked through in the first place. Then I quickly got out of the building and back into my well-lit building. Finally, I was able to calm down. I sat down and thought, what was that other red light I saw? It was a good bit before I ever saw the exit sign light. And who was in there talking to me? Encounter with a Demon From Conky Joe 89 I was 26 years old when this happened. This was not my first graveyard shift job, but it was the only one where I worked alone, and it will certainly be the last one I ever work. Now, I don't mind the location being shared, and honestly, I encourage the sharing of the locale, as I'm always interested in hearing stories from my home state of Texas, and I'm especially curious as to whether anyone else has experienced anything like this whether it be the particular thing I encountered, or whether just under similar circumstances. Let me just say up front, I was not under the influence of any drugs, nor had I been drinking. If I'm going to be 100% forthcoming, the reason I wound up living and working where I did was that I just completed a detox and subsequent residential stay in a drug treatment program. So funnily enough, you could say I was as sober as possible, Definitely not one of the better times in my life, but we live and learn, right? Anyway, enough of my background and babbling. On to what I saw, whatever it was. I worked the graveyard shift as the maintenance man at a huge retirement community located in the town of Temple, Texas, near the end of 2015. I clocked in at 7 p.m. and clocked out at 6 a.m., the old folks didn't have to be out of what I'll call the community building and back into their own individual apartments until 9 p.m. So there would be about a two-hour window when I showed up where the community building would have a lot of friendly older people hanging around. They'd be playing cards, chatting, exercising, that type of stuff. Couldn't be a more warm and inviting vibe, honestly. And then, like clockwork, there would be a change in energy. I'll never forget when I first became aware of it, because every shift after that, as the clock crept closer to 9 p.m., an uneasy feeling of dread and anticipation would set in on me. It was so heavy and palpable. I knew that soon I'd be isolated in that huge and quiet building, all alone. Or at least it would appear that way. There was something going on in that building. There were windows lining the entirety of the building, they looked out onto the parking lot outside, and the building was set up in a sort of U-shape, or a horseshoe, so that from one hall, you could look across the parking lot and see the other hallway that made up the other half of this U. I would constantly see someone, or something, walking along the corridors on whatever side of the building I wasn't on. It was just strange at first. I kept thinking, nah, surely it's just the blinds parted in a certain way, or... No, it's just because I'm moving over here that it appears something over there is moving too. I was never successful in actually physically spotting this figure, even though on the majority of time I would see it and attempt to rush over. There was quite literally nowhere for anyone to hide or anywhere for them to go except back down the hall and past me. But I would never find anyone, only serving to further my suspicions that there was something very off going on within this place. Not necessarily anything evil or threatening, just off. Seeing as how this wasn't really a business establishment, it was more a set of communal buildings as I said before. The employees, both daytime and nights graveyard duties, didn't really have a proper break room, as it were. So we would all use the refrigerator and the coffee prep station that was really meant for the older folks to utilize when they were having breakfast or getting snacks over the course of the day. I cannot count the number of times I'd feel like having a quick pick-me-up coffee, or maybe a complimentary carrot cake slice or three, and when rounding the corner beside the coffee and the fridge area, a nurse from the hospice wing would either already be there, or would also be rounding the corner from their side of the complex, scaring the absolute crap out of me. Just imagine, it's been something like five or six hours into your shift, and you haven't seen or heard a single person, voice, or anything. 
except that sort of phantom-like figure, the one you can never seem to truly locate. And suddenly, boom, there's someone not even two feet away from you, totally unexpected. Those nurses probably thought I was a very odd dude, given that every time they saw me, it would be me rounding a corner into the break area and almost having a sheer heart attack at the sight of them. Now, I'm absolutely certain I came off as the more than capable, competent, and unshakable overnight maintenance man that the community of older folks needed to keep their homes up and running all night without fail or issues arising. But as things tend to do over the weeks and months that followed, I grew accustomed to just expecting someone to be in that break area, at least once or twice over my long, dragging shift. So it eased my tensions, if only slightly. Well, that newfound sense of being able to let my guard down, and not constantly being a walking bundle of nerves, all came to an end one night when I was in what I called the dead end. Ironic, really. It was the side of the U where the hallway ended in an office, a gym room, and a physical therapy room. The other side of the U had a door that led to still more rooms and areas, so over there it felt, I don't know, less claustrophobic and isolated. But the dead end, it had an energy about it. You would always feel like something was at your back, watching, brooding. The worst part was having to run a vacuum down there because you constantly felt the need to spin around and check your back, because you couldn't rely on sounds to alert you. Well, one day I was cleaning up the dead end. Other than that creepy feeling, it was going fairly normal. But then, something odd caught my eye. Through the window, out towards the rear parking lot, there was a dimly lit sidewalk lining the building that led around to a separate, employee-only parking lot in the back. And leaning around the corner of that wall, just barely illuminated by the lamppost, which it was gripping and almost trying to conceal itself with, was a very tall, slender, half-physical, half-apparition, and very demonic-looking figure. This figure stood about eight feet tall. Well, I say stood, but as you looked toward the feet, it just sort of faded away. It didn't become whole or solid looking until about the upper thigh, the lower waist area, where it was cloaked in a garment that was tattered and thin, open in the front, revealing emaciated looking ribs. Its arms were extremely long and thin, and it didn't seem to have five fingers on its hands. Instead, there were maybe three or four. But it didn't have normal human hands. They were oversized, and where the fingers should have started, the flesh of this thing's hands seemed to sort of erupt into massive bone-like claws. I use the word erupt because where the claws jutted out from the hands, it's as if that flesh was newly injured, like it had just intentionally unsheathed these claws from within its hands. Yeah, think Wolverine from the X-Men type vibes. It was disgusting, and I'm pretty sure I could definitely see trickling streams of blood cascading from these claws onto the cement below. Perched atop a skinny neck was a skull-like head, sort of like cattle, but on top of its head were massive horns like a buck's. The thing simply stood there, watching me. I could feel its gaze bore into me. I was overwhelmed with nausea and dread, it sounded kind of extreme, but the only way I could describe it was that it felt like happiness was suddenly rendered a foreign concept to me. I felt as if I could never be happy again, like I had never actually been happy before. Just sad that I was leading a wasted life, that I would one day have a death that no one would mourn or even notice. It was like while I had my eyes on this thing, there was only me and it. Almost like for those few seconds, it and I stood outside of normal time or something. When I finally snapped to my senses, I literally ran away. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I ran my rear off. My heart was leaping into my throat. As I said before, as far as I know, all that thing did was stay there, creepily observing me. I assume it was watching me, even as I fled. From that day on, I started cleaning the dead end while there were still residents hanging about, so that hopefully, I would never be put in that position again. I wouldn't last but probably a few more months at that place anyway, 
Then I was out of there. I'd had enough. I never did encounter that entity again, but that one time was more than enough for me. I was working in constant fear and anxiety that I would see it again, and I dreaded that the next time I saw it, it would be from a not so safe distance. What I saw there stuck with me. I definitely think that the fact that there was a hospice hallway on the opposite side of the same building, where we'd lose at least one person every couple of weeks or so, played a large part in attracting this entity to the location. Perhaps it was to feed on the negative energy associated with death or the dying, to feed off the feeling of hopelessness those poor people assuredly felt as they knew their life was slipping away from them. I often get unnerved even recanting this experience to anyone. This isn't the only paranormal experience I've had, far from it, but this was easily one of the most unsettling ones. Haunting at the Funeral Home From Lady Mortician I'm a 20-something-year-old female who graduated mortuary school in 2015. Now, I know what you're thinking. And yes, that is a job you have to go to school for. Shortly after graduation, I left my small hometown in central North Carolina for a job opportunity in a major city in Wisconsin. Living in a small town, we only had two funeral homes both family-owned and operated, and unless you're family, it's very difficult to get a foot in the door, so to speak. So not wanting my education to go to waste, I moved halfway across the country to start my apprenticeship as a funeral director and embalmer. Working with the dead never scared me. Up until then, I had never encountered anything spooky or paranormal. In fact, I found embalming to be very clinical, the quietness of the funeral home to be calming and peaceful. This particular funeral home I was working for relied on the apprentices for working after regular business hours, which meant being on call every other night and every other weekend. There were four of us, two pairs, you always went on calls with your apprentice partner. For privacy reasons, I'll call my partner Peter. It was probably January or February. Earlier that day, we'd gotten a decedent in, a homicide victim. This was not my first homicide case, nor my last but one of the most memorable. The young man was an immigrant who came to the United States to start a better life. He'd worked at a nearby gas station at night while he went to school during the day. We all think we know how we'd react in a scary or a violent situation, but you truly never know until you find yourself in one, a lesson this young man learned the hard way. He'd been working the night shift alone when two men attempted to rob the store, the only protection the clerk had was a baseball bat, and he'd been overpowered and beaten to death with that bat. To say his body was a mess would be an understatement. The reconstruction would take hours, even with multiple embalmers working together. Once the medical examiner finished their autopsy, the body was released to our funeral home. We were to embalm him, perform the extensive reconstruction work on his head and face, then have his body shipped back to his home country. I recall vividly how I felt walking into the embalming room that day to help the team repair this man's broken body. It's a feeling I'd never experienced before, and never again after. Walking in, I was overcome with this deep, visceral feeling of great sadness. I was almost brought to tears. The atmosphere was so heavy and sad. Peter could tell that something was up, because normally, when I go into the embalming room, I'm usually very chipper, playing music on the radio, singing along, talking to the deceased as though they were keeping me company. Even when I went home for the day, I could not shake that somber feeling. That night was to be Peter and I's night on call. Around 2am, the phone was ringing. It was Peter telling me that we'd gotten a death call, which meant we had to go into the funeral home and use one of the company vehicles to remove the body from the place of death. Half asleep, I pulled on my spare pair of clothes I kept sitting out for such events. Working in a big city, it's rare to go through the night with no calls. I slowly made my way to the funeral home. Being a southern girl, I'm not used to driving with eight plus inches of snow on the ground. When I arrived at the funeral home, I was surprised to see that Peter had not arrived yet. I thought for sure he would arrive before me. Luckily, I had a spare key, 
so I let myself in through the back door of the funeral home. Now, the layout of the funeral home is important to the story, so let me take a moment to explain. We always come in from the back entrance on the main floor. Also on the main floor are the chapels in the front of the building and the embalming room in the back of the building. Our offices are in the basement. The second floor is an abandoned apartment where the original owner had lived while he ran the funeral home. In order to get to the stairs that lead down to the offices, you had to pass the door to the embalming room, a large white industrial door with a lock and keypad entry system. So I turned on a couple of lights and I made my way downstairs to get clocked in and to collect paperwork that I would need to do our removal. I'm sitting at my desk working on the paperwork when I began to hear footsteps up above me in one of the chapels. Knowing that the building is locked up tight, I shrugged it off. It is a very old building after all. I then hear footsteps coming down the stairs from the main floor. So I called out to Peter to let him know I'm in the office. I waited a moment and received no response. So, still thinking nothing of it, I called out again. Peter? Knock it off, I'm in here. Come help me with the paperwork so we can hurry this up and get back to bed. I called out. Silence. Five seconds passed, then ten. I started to get an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. I was then startled by my phone chiming. It was a text from Peter. Sorry, roads are bad out my way. I'll be there soon. It read. Reading those words, I felt my blood run cold. I knew what I heard. I knew I'd heard footsteps. Quietly, I collected my paperwork and I peered out the door of my office. I didn't see anything or anyone. My relief was short-lived, however, as I was making my way up the stairs to the main floor to load a stretcher into the van, the lights in the stairwell started to flicker. I noped the heck out of there. I've never loaded the van up so quickly. I waited in the van for Peter to arrive, not wanting to spend another minute alone in the funeral home. Eventually, Peter did arrive. We performed our body removal and made it back to the funeral home. Peter took the deceased into the embalming room, writing up their toe tags, then leaving them on the stretcher to be embalmed in the morning. I told Peter to go ahead and head home. I knew the roads were bad, and I would just have to go downstairs to assign the case to one of the licensed funeral directors and clock us out. As I headed down a few minutes later, Peter called out that he was leaving. I heard the door lock shut behind him. Peter had a bad habit of turning every single light off when he leaves, even when he's not the only one in the building. That night was no exception. Peter never left the lights on to the embalming room, though. Using the flashlight on my phone, I made my way to the stairs and started to walk up to the main level. I was two or three stairs from the top when I heard it. This absolutely gut-wrenching sobbing. It's the most heartbroken wailing I've ever heard. I stopped cold. That was not the voice of Peter. And besides, I heard him lock up and leave. As quietly as I could, I climbed the remaining steps. Without daring to even breathe, I poked my head out of the stairwell and looked around. The hair on the back of my neck stood up on end. Then I realized that not only is the light on in the embalming room, but that's where the sobbing had been coming from. My heart felt as though it was going to beat right out of my chest. My mind was screaming for me to get the heck out of there, but I was frozen in fear. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard a loud banging coming from the other side of the big industrial door. This banging seemed to shock me back to reality, and I hightailed it to the back door. I fumbled with my keys trying to get out, the crying and banging continuing even as I shoved the door open and locked it behind me. I jumped into my car and took a moment to take a few calming breaths, trying to slow my racing heart. Once my heart rate was no longer at heart attack levels, I inserted my key and put the car into reverse. I could not stop myself from yelping when I heard my backup sensor begin to ding. Something, or someone, was behind my vehicle. I looked in my rearview mirror and nearly screamed. In the mirror, I see a black human-shaped mass illuminated by my taillights. I checked my backup camera display, and the shadow figure did not show up on that display. At this point, I was crying. I was too scared to get out of my car to check, too scared to even stay there and wait it out. I took a deep breath and decided to just go for it. I floored it, 
skidding backwards in the snow through where the shadow had just been. When I looked up, the shadow was gone. In its place, I saw something I'll never forget. In the snow, there was one set of footprints. The footprints go from where the shadow person was and led to the brick wall, which formed one side of the embalming room. I've never driven away from there so fast. The following day, I called my boss and explained what happened. He's an older man who's been in the industry his whole life. His father owned the funeral home, as did his grandfather before him. He shared that he's had a few experiences of his own. He agreed to let me work out of one of our other locations until the homicide victim was shipped out later that week. My first day back to the main location was apprehensive, scared of what or who may be waiting for me. But when I walked into the embalming room, the air felt lighter, like a weight had been lifted. To this day, I still cannot come up with any explanation other than the young homicide victim was not ready to cross over and just wanted to make his presence known. Many people I've told this story to have not believed me, but I know what happened. There is more to life and death than can rationally be explained. Of that, I'm certain. You get used to it. From Mike V. I worked as a security guard at one of the local hospitals, and despite what I'm going to tell you, it's a pretty good place to work. Hours are plentiful, pay is good, and the nurses are downright sweet. That being said, it is still a hospital, and as such comes with its own bad things. I confess and forgive me if I come across as a little morbid, I've been in the presence of more death in the first six months on the job than the previous 30 years of my life but that's not what this is about. This story is about the hospital basement. Now, I had initially been hired to work a specific area of the hospital. I had daytime hours, but when a full-time evening shift opened up, I went for it. Gotta make that extra money, which meant I had free range to patrol the whole property. One of the areas I had to patrol was the basement, which contrary to what you might think, is a pretty busy part of the building. X-ray department, custodian, engineering, food prep, those are just some of the many departments that fill this basement, so it's not exactly a spooky dark place like you might imagine. However, once 8pm hits and the vast majority of employees have gone home, that basement gets very quiet, and that's when the incidents began. It was my first week as patrol officer, and so far had been rather uneventful which I was fine with as a five-year veteran of private security in other areas. I was kind of hoping for less action for a while. One night I was making my rounds in the basement when I began to hear footsteps. Normally, this is no big deal, but it was late, so it caught my attention right away. Now, I figured it was maybe a nurse who had to grab something or a visitor who took a hilariously big wrong turn, so I wandered over in that direction. As I approached the corner... I checked the wall mirror. For those of you who don't know, hospitals have ball-shaped mirrors to allow staff to check around corners, thus preventing any gurney fender benders. But I saw nothing. No people, no shadows, no movement of any kind. I rounded the corner to make sure, and it was an empty hallway. Only place they could have turned into were the elevators, and I would have heard the ding from them if someone had entered. It was strange, but I shrugged it off probably my brain messing with me. A similar incident happened a few days later. While checking to make sure that engineering didn't leave their equipment in plain sight, again, I suddenly heard voices. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it was for sure human voices. I went to check, out of curiosity more than anything else. But no matter where I walked, the voices always seemed distant. I didn't see anyone, and I must have walked the entire basement but the voices always sounded distant. Then suddenly, it went quiet, just like that, as if they'd left the area. How very strange, but again, I chalked it up to nothing unusual. Maybe some custodian had left a radio or podcast on or something. In my mind, it was all so easily explained and no big deal. While that could be explained easily enough, this next one was unnerving 
because I can't explain it to this very day. It was another day, another basement patrol, and I was walking down a large stretch of hallway, when in front of me I noticed a set of doors close. These are the fire doors that held open magnetically. They're automatically closed upon the fire alarm going off, which incidentally had happened earlier that day. A false alarm in case you're wondering. Clearly these two had not been pushed open after the all clear, so I walked over towards them to do the job. Then one of them opened up. Not swung open aggressively, but just casually opened, like someone was just passing through. This caused me to stop in my tracks in shock. These doors are pretty heavy, so nobody could have just yanked it open and ducked out of sight. This door was pushed to the wall in one smooth motion, not shoved or slightly opened. Unless there was a very specifically located hurricane in that spot, those doors were not hit by a sudden draft. Not one strong enough to open a fire door all the way. Needless to say, I decided to patrol the more populated areas that night. There was also the cold spots. So many cold spots in that basement. This wasn't wind or air conditioning, these were specific moments of cold that randomly disappeared shortly afterwards. These weren't normal, they were everywhere. Not just the same spots every time. Different spots. Spots where it should have been warm such as by the food prep kitchen or near the CT scan room. It really made no sense. A few weeks of all these things and I was just doing my best to ignore it. The job paid well and I didn't want to abandon ship just like that. But that nearly changed one evening. Another basement patrol. Woohoo, sadly I can't skip it or say I did when I didn't because the higher ups, they would have known. So I was back again late at night in the creepy empty basement, telling myself that my car will be paid off a lot faster with this salary. I was approaching the corner from the first incident and checked the wall mirror on instinct, and I froze. A figure stood just around the corner, not a person, but a human-shaped black mass. It was just standing there around the corner. I was horrified at that point, my mind already on high alert, now it was on red alert. I tried to reason with myself, it's just a smudge in the mirror. No, it couldn't be that, they clean those daily. I was horrified, shaken up, I was wishing I had a fellow guard with me. But what good would that really do, honestly? I was praying to God, Odin, Ra, freaking Santa Claus if I had to, that this thing didn't decide to move towards me. I stood there for what seemed like an eternity, when that thing finally walks the opposite direction of me. Defying all sense of reason, I decided to poke my head around the corner to try to get a look at this thing. But by then, it was gone. Disappeared. I looked up at the mirror, and it was clear as well. Just me in this basement. I scrambled up the stairs at a sprint and spent the remainder of the shift around the nurse's station expecting very little sleep that night when I got home. A couple of months later, and short of the aforementioned cold spots, things had calmed down. I was working an earlier shift one day, down in the basement with a co-worker doing the rounds, when I heard the sound of voices. Now, admittedly, at that time of day, it could have been anyone, but I was still quite paranoid about this basement, so my mind instantly went to the worst possible scenario. I stopped then to turn to my co-worker asking in a freaked out sounding way if they could hear those voices. To my relief, they said yes. I calmed down a bit, then my coworker replied, you get used to it. And I instantly stopped and stared at them. What do you mean? I ask. Voices, weird noises and all that crap. Work here long enough and you get used to it, especially in this area. I assumed you saw or heard something, judging by how you looked like a deer in headlights just now. I told them about my experiences, and they said, Yeah, most of us all have had similar incidents when patrolling this area. Don't worry about it. You'll learn to shrug it off. I feel I should add quickly that this coworker is older and has been with the company for about 15 years, which to me explained how they were so casual and nonchalant about it while I was losing my crap. Why this area? I asked. Never anywhere else. Do you really have to ask? They laughed. Then it hit me, and I almost kicked myself for not figuring it out. 
The shadow figure, the footsteps, the voices, the door, even the majority of the cold spots, they all happened within a close proximity of the morgue. I'd been given a tour of the facility when I started, but seeing as I was assigned a specific post when I began, I kinda just forgot about the morgue and its location. Why wasn't I told at the start? I asked. Because you wouldn't have believed us, admit it. They responded. I admit they were right. Had they mentioned it on day one, I would have laughed it off as either messing with the new guy or just silly stories, so I can't blame them. I worked at that hospital for a year before being transferred to a different site. Still a hospital, but this one doesn't have an ER, ICU, or a morgue, so I feel better. The coworkers are great, job still pays well, and I genuinely like being here. But still, I double-check those mirrors when I approach any corner, and I still jump at any sound when I'm alone at night on the job. I hope against hope that eventually I'll get used to it. Warning. The following story contains harsh depictions of violence against pets. Cynthia. From Officer Nobody. I'm a young police officer in a southern city. As a child, it was my dream to become one. I made tinfoil badges and carved sticks to look like pistols. I took reports with crayons and chased imaginary criminals. Twenty or so years later, I average three hours of sleep and have grueling anxiety attacks. Like my peers, I've seen terrible things. It's what we signed up for, so I don't expect sympathy. In 2018, I responded to a welfare check where I found a two-week-old decomposed body. The man had hanged himself with copper wire inside a closet. His skin was so rotted that it separated where the wire attached. It was an unwanted but gnarly anatomy lesson. It was mid-June, so the smell was unbearable. But hey, dead bodies were a dime a dozen. In 2019, I helped scrape a woman from the pavement following a crash. Her survived husband watched from a distance. But hey, I dealt with hysterical loved ones weekly. In 2020, I watched a homeless man burn alive inside a shed. He had locked the door from the inside and couldn't find the key. The window was too narrow to climb out of. His space heater had caught fire. But hey, the fire marshal took the report. I don't mean to sound callous or smug. I only want to depict reality. The truth is, as disgusting as those stories are, they are not the reason behind my insomnia. They are not the reason for my anxiety. Frankly, I hardly think about them. My trauma comes from 2021, where I responded to a call that haunts me every second. It was around 3 a.m. I was typing a larceny report in my car while Ozark played in the background. It was the scene where Wendy's lover gets thrown off a building and goes splat in front of Marty. Crazy scene. It was a mid-80s summer night amongst a full moon. By that time, everything was calm. The night shift was shorthanded, so my typical beat partner wasn't working. Dispatch requested me for a welfare check. Welfare checks are usually harmless, although it is when you find the most dead bodies. Welfare checks are what they sound like, checking the welfare of a person and ensuring they're okay. The reporting party is usually a family member who couldn't get a hold of the person. I received this information and began driving. I was tasked with checking the welfare of an elderly woman who lived alone on the outskirts of town, barely within city limits. Her granddaughter lived a few states away and hadn't heard from her. She assumed that her grandma accidentally switched her cell phone to silent, as she often did. Dispatch usually sends two officers, but every now and again they'll give an officer an option to take the call alone. Because of staffing levels and the nature of the call, I decided to handle it myself. Worst case scenario, Granny bit the dust and I would call a medical examiner to work an unattended death. I drove a good 15 minutes to the residence, another 100 feet north and it would have been county jurisdiction. Lucky me, right? There were no other houses in the area. It was so quiet that the sound of gravel under my tires was thunderous. Beyond the mailbox was a locked gate and a long dirt driveway. 
I absolutely did not want to walk that driveway alone in the dark without my patrol car. I grabbed my radio to call for another officer, but changed my mind. I would have looked silly asking for help after committing to doing it solo. Plus, it would have been an even longer drive for them. I decided to man up, jump the gate, and make what turned out to be the worst decision in my life. If it wasn't for the moonlight, it would have been so dark that I couldn't see my feet. I was trained to be tactical with my flashlight, only using it in short bursts. It was a good way to be sneaky. I finally reached the house and stood in front of it. It was an old wooden home with two stories. Every window was pinch black, besides one on the second floor, and had a purple curtain with white stripes. I stepped on the unstable wraparound porch and listened carefully. There was nothing but absolute silence. No TV, no creaks, no fans, nothing. Tentatively, I knocked and announced myself. There was no answer and no noise. I knocked even louder and announced again, still nothing. I stepped off the porch to reevaluate the situation. Once far enough, I looked up to the second story. The light was off. Typically, something like that wouldn't creep me out, but the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. Since the light was off, I couldn't see whether someone was looking back at me. I had a terrifying feeling that they were. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it in through the window. No one was standing there, but the curtain had moved and was still swaying. I went back to the door and knocked even louder, telling her who I was and why I was there. Cynthia, it's Officer Blank with the Blank Police Department. I'm just checking your welfare. I stood there for several minutes in eerie silence. I was ready to hightail it back to the road, but figured I'd wait another minute. I had done my job for the most part. I was there to make sure she wasn't dead. If she wanted to ignore me, fine. I was creeped out, and without a partner, I wasn't going to press the issue. For some reason, before walking away, I decided to try the doorknob. This isn't usual practice, since it could be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. I couldn't enter the home without a warrant, exigent circumstances, or permission. To my surprise and regret, the door opened. Apparently, the heavy wooden door needed its hinges tightened, because it slowly opened all the way until it knocked against the wall. I shined my light inside. It was definitely an old woman's residence. Everything was lavender and tidy. There were creepy portraits of hairless cats in the walls. There were also statues of them. I reached my hand inside to flick on the light, but it didn't activate. At first, I thought the house had no power. There were no sounds of electricity at all, and it was hotter than a sauna with no airflow. Then I remembered the light upstairs. The whole situation was odd and unsettling. I decided to dial my supervisor to get his opinion. I was hoping he would tell me to leave, call the reporting person, and explain what I observed. Before I was able to dial, I heard a sound which haunts me every night. A chilling noise that will die with me. You won't believe me and I don't blame you. It was the sound of intense laughter. Not a giggle, but delirious, gut-busting laughter from what sounded like an old lady. I never drew my Glock faster than I did right then. Hello? Who's in there? Before I could finish the sentence, it stopped. I'm not too embarrassed to admit that I turned around and bolted for my car, gun in hand. Just as I left the porch, I was stopped in my tracks. Another equally loud and terrifying noise echoed from the house. This time, it was a scream of someone clearly in distress. It sounded like the same voice, but I wasn't sure. Dang it, I thought to myself. Exigent circumstances. I radioed dispatch and told them what I heard. I advised them that I would be clearing the house. Another officer started en route, but I couldn't wait. I wanted to, but there was no way I could explain waiting 15 to 20 minutes to enter the house of an elderly woman in danger. I entered the hot living room and cleared the immediate area. I knew at least one person was upstairs. 
The narrow staircase led to a pitch black second floor. Before going up, I announced myself again, and again, to no avail. I began walking up the staircase as calmly as I could. I remember imagining a scenario where I'm clearing the bedrooms and Cynthia pops out of a dark corner. I'd have to explain to the reporting person why I shot her grandma in the face. When upstairs, I checked two rooms that were completely empty. No furniture or anything. I then realized that the last bedroom was the same one that had the light. I announced myself and prayed for a response. I didn't get one, so I grabbed the doorknob and twisted. I swung it open and was immediately met with a nauseating odor. It was the worst I'd ever experienced, almost knocking me down. I illuminated the room with my light. In every corner, on every wall, were dead, skinned cats pinned to wooden crosses. Some were rotten, some were fresh. There was dried blood literally everywhere. Fur and detached claws covered the floor. I dry heaved as I cleared the closet. It was empty. I stumbled my way back downstairs where I vomited on the front porch. I ran to the road to wait for my partner. Once he arrived, we called for even more people and my supervisor. We cleared the house again with no signs of Cynthia. Fast forward to the next evening. The reporting person flew in with other family members. They searched the ten or so acres and found an old abandoned car in the brush. They found her grandma there, leaned back in the passenger seat, deceased for what appeared to be several days. Neither detectives nor the medical examiner would determine the cause of death. Detectives interviewed another family member who said Cynthia had severe schizophrenia and dementia. Inside her home in a kitchen drawer, detectives discovered pages and pages of Hebrew writings. The writings translated to devoted allegiances to the devil Tarot, a devil god that many Satanists worship. Her writings claimed that Tarot asked her to sacrifice her beloved cats. Some believe that I heard Cynthia's laughter and scream and that the upstairs light was on. Some don't. Trust me, sometimes I question it myself. For some reason, my body camera never downloaded to the system. It's like the footage never existed, even though I know it was on. No other calls from that night downloaded either. It even baffled my department. I have constant nightmares about Cynthia. In them, she's laughing with the same terrifying laugh. She has unusually long fingers and nails that almost scrape the ground when she walks. I never move fast enough to get away from her. I reach for my gun, but it's never there. She always gets me, and then I wake up. I don't know why I'm still a cop. Maybe it's all I know how to do. I only have 12 more years and many, many more therapy sessions before I can retire. I wasn't a supernatural believer before my experience, but I am now. To those aspiring to be police officers, heed my advice. Be a firefighter instead. Mima's Photograph From Andrew On the third floor of one of the largest buildings on my college campus, there's a computer lab that hides a strange photograph. If you head over to the very back, along the right wall, carefully step onto the desk situated against the corner and look up, you can just make out the bezel of a picture frame, aligned with a block only a few feet away from the ceiling. If you're feeling brave, you can climb up even further onto the ledge running along the wall, and if you stretch yourself out and stand on the tips of your toes, you can reach said picture frame. When you grab it, which I really don't recommend you do, and make your way down, you'll find the black and white image of a cute girl, no more than 20 years of age, smiling at you, captioned with a simple message, rest in peace, Mima. Here's my story about that bizarre memorial. I was a student and employee there. They hired second year IT students for entry level positions. At the time, it was the end of the summer, one of the last days before our shifts switched from full-time to part-time nights. 
My co-workers and I were relaxing in the aforementioned room. It was our favorite, one that was nicely air-conditioned and far enough away from IT services to be secure in the knowledge that we wouldn't run into our bosses. It even had a workable projector to boot. After lying back in the small office chair at one of the stations, our co-worker pointed the photo out to us with a, Hey, what's that? Even craning our necks, we couldn't make it out properly because of how high up it was. So after some deliberation, the tallest guy among us decided to make his way up. He collected the picture frame, bringing it down and placing it on the desk so we could all see. I don't think any of us read the tiny caption right away, instead opting to take in the image of the beautiful girl smiling in the photo. When someone finally spoke it out loud, it being, rest in peace Mimo, tension filled the air. It was an odd image to find, especially hidden away up in the corner of the room, as if it was deliberately placed out of reach. It didn't take long for one of us to joke that the room was now haunted, which helped us to return to our casual atmosphere. Then we encouraged him to put the picture back, lest the imaginary ghost get angry. And he did, though he couldn't be bothered to climb up once more. So instead, he tossed it back up to where it had been before. We heard the sharp thud of wood as the frame landed and squarely fell over, presumably onto its face. I might have cringed a little then at the haphazard way the photo was tossed, but I never spoke up. Sure enough, we'd forgotten about the picture by the end of the day. It didn't cross my mind again, at least not until I arrived home. After a few drinks, I went to bed, not before googling a little to see if I could find anything about a girl named Mima, who might have died under some tragic circumstance at my campus. However, nothing came up with my first few queries, and so I give up. When I arrived back at campus that morning, the first thing I did was visit the room. Not to pay respects or anything, I just wanted to drop off my bag. When I got to the door, I pulled my keycard, swiping it on the reader. But nothing happened. I swiped again, and again. After the fifth time, I stopped trying, assuming the authentication mechanism might have been down across the campus. That theory proved wrong only a minute later as I headed into the office where we had our work items assigned. Both my card and other readers were functioning, and yet the one laboratory did not want to open up. This became all the more relevant a few hours later, when my coworkers and I made our way up to the room to take our lunch break. They swiped, and they too were rejected. Each of us ended up trying, only to determine the reader was simply broken. I remember us opting to go and find another room to eat in, though we lamented the fact that we couldn't use our preferred one. It was curious to me though. My mind kept trying to draw coincidental lines between our discovery of that photograph and the door locking. Obviously, there was nothing going on, but for some reason I couldn't shake the feeling that our interaction with that picture might have contributed. Over time, however, I forgot about her. My friends and I had moved on to a new room, one that was arguably superior because the lab featured Windows machines over IMAX, and we more or less stopped mentioning the old lab. I do remember one instance where I asked my coworkers if any of them had found anything online about Mima, but it seemed I was the only one with enough curiosity to even bother researching her. When my work transitioned to part-time shifts at the start of September, I was not looking forward to it whatsoever. I was now spending even more time on campus. My eight-hour course time of the new semester, followed by a two-hour break, then a four-hour night shift starting at 5 p.m. This led me to being there all day. During these shifts, one other person served with me. I got along with him very well, and so it really wasn't too bad. The first few weeks went by fine. Lots of asset replacement, pushing our tiny trolleys around campus and ripping out old computers and monitors at the end of their warranty periods, then bringing in their replacements. It was all pretty uneventful work, up until the evening right near the end of September, where we got assigned a ticket in our old favorite place, Mima's room. The ticket, which was a PDF, only contained the boring room number, but it was the lab. 
We both laughed when we saw it, obviously opting to do that ticket first. The work seemed trivial. A handful of computers showing offline needed to be assessed. We worked our way to the building and headed upstairs, first checking the nearby printer to make sure it was functional. Then I swiped my car on the door. Lo and behold, nothing. My coworker tried too. It was just as broken as it was before. It seemed facilities still hadn't fixed it. Of course, card readers weren't the only way to access the room. Though it was a hassle, we could go over to security and sign out the massive two-pound contractor keyring. And that's just what we did. We opted to finish up our other tickets first, and so when we arrived at the lab with the security keys, it was near dark outside. It took us a few minutes, but we eventually found the right family of keys to fit in the lock, then the specific one to open the door. It swung open with a creak, and what we were greeted with was bizarre. The motion-activated lights had failed almost completely. Only the fluorescent panel directly above our heads lit up. It quickly became obvious why lab computers were showing offline. Ethernet and power cords were strewn about the room. At first it seemed random, cables thrown about in disarray. But as I stared on, it looked to be more purposeful. Almost like a barrier. As we exchanged bewilderment, I focused. Two-thirds of the way into the room, cables were woven together to create some sort of guard, dividing the rest of the space no more than two feet high. Quickly, he suggested we call security. I nodded. It was bizarre, though. It wasn't like the lab had been robbed. Whoever had made a mess of the room did it in a particular, intricate manner. It must have taken hours. As he took out his phone, I tried using the panel on the wall to override the motion sensor. It didn't work. The lights refused to activate. As I pressed each switch, I became aware of someone else in the room. It was hard to notice with the noise we were making. I don't think he heard it at all. I ushered my partner to be quiet, and when he was, we both picked up on it. It was a girl, crying, very quietly. It was at the back of the lab, beyond the messy blockade of wires. The light from the strip above us couldn't reach that area though, and so we could not see her. Before I could say anything, he shouted hello, asking who was there. Then with the line to security waiting to be picked up, he turned on his phone flashlight, shining it in the direction the sobbing was coming from. We both were terrified. Her head was in her hands, and she wore a plain white dress. Even though every sense of realism I had screamed that it was impossible, she looked exactly like Mimo. My colleague recognized her too. Immediately, he knew something was wrong. We both stepped out together, keeping an eye on the hard-to-make-out sobbing girl as we did. When we were in the hallway, we shut the door, stepping back to the other side of the hallway and staring. We sat down outside the door when the security guard showed up. Our faces must have been white as snow, judging by the way he spoke to us. All I said was that there was someone in the room who shouldn't be there. He didn't prompt us for any more information, instead moving to unlock the door with his keycard. Unexpectedly, it worked. It opened into a perfectly normal computer lab. Everything was back where it should have been. Even the lights were functional. We heard the telltale sounds of computers POSTing around the room, or power on self-test, as if multiple just had their power sources restored. The guard walked into the room, asked if anyone was there, and inspected each and every space a person could hide. Given there were only two exits to the room, both being in our field of view, he suggested we were mistaken, because there was no one inside, and no way they could have gotten out. I remember having to fill out a short report. He called in something to the office after that. He stayed with us as we worked on our ticket, which helped us feel a little more secure. My partner and I were now in the laboratory, confused and creeped out as all heck. Mutually, we decided to finish up the work and exit as soon as possible. Bizarrely though, every computer which had been listed as downed on the work item we had was now perfectly up and running. After a quick check, 
it became clear there was no work to be done. Of course, we told all our co-workers about it, our night shift manager too. Neither believed us, though the latter was good-humored and assumed we were joking. Between my co-worker and I, we never came up with a logical explanation, and instead it became a staple of conversation that over time turned comedic. After that, though, a series of bizarre events started to occur. It was just little stuff at first. IT services had a few of our own spaces secured with keycards, the office building and a neighboring one filled with workstations, monitors, and keyboards. Frequently, we went through both, not only to retrieve items, but also because they were pretty central in campus construction and served as great shortcuts. But here and there, we would notice little oddities, things that should not be there. The drawings were the first of them. I remember being messaged a picture by someone who worked the night after me. It was of a cartoon cat, drawn seemingly with crayon on one of the walls of the storage room. It wasn't all too weird, although I could count on my fingers the number of people that had access to that space. Over time, more and more appeared. All sorts of animals, symbols, and stick figure people, drawn in a childish crayon over the walls. Our IT team eventually adopted a mock competition to see who could find the newest illustration first. Nobody ever came forward to admit it was them drawing. Not even when our bosses got all huffy and asked who was vandalizing the place, threatening to check the security cameras if no one came forward. At the same time, we began to notice another form of art. Origami. Crafted shapes of cranes and other animals began popping up in our secure spaces. They were always made out of the same blue paper. The creepiest thing about them was that if you found one and removed it, the next day, another would be back in the same spot, identically folded and poised. I must have collected 30 of these over the course of a few weeks, and they kept on being replaced. The next and more inexplicable series of events that occurred began on a Saturday. I remember specifically because the guy who was unlucky enough to have the full 8-hour Saturday shift blew up our Discord chat talking about how he had heard a girl giggling and hasty footsteps down in the asset storage area. Everybody was quick to call him out, save me and my coworker, but given we live in the age of smartphones, he had attached a recording. It was as he described, him following the sound of a girl's laughter around the secured space, never able to catch up with her, but always close enough to hear. I remember watching as he swore and opted to take the exit before he made his way down to security to fill out a report. I decided to take the initiative, being the first to call it the ghost of Meemaw. With two separate experiences to go off of, plus the bizarre artifacts we were finding, the ghost of Meemaw now became an all-too-believable urban legend among our IT team. Over the next few weeks, the timeline intensified. All of us experienced some out-of-the-ordinary event. Most of it was laughter and sounds that shouldn't have been there. Some were visual. I remember being outdoors one day. It was already dark out. I was pushing a trolley of computers when I heard the bizarre sound of someone skipping. I turned to my left and watched a slim girl dressed in white skipping by me and past the corner of the building, humming to herself. Naturally, I followed, prepping my phone to record her. But when I turned the corner into a wide open stretch of campus with practically zero places to hide, she had completely vanished. The creepiest experience must have been one that four of us saw all together. This was the week leading up to Christmas, and while every student and the majority of staff were on break, we had the opportunity to return to full-time hours for the five days. Me and three others had signed up. At that point, Meemaw seemed more like a novelty than anything dangerous, and so it wasn't a deterrent to work, especially considering how much we needed money around the holidays. That interpretation quickly changed, though. We were in a building on the north side of campus. After spending the better part of the day wheeling trolleys full of brand new desktops and monitors up to the building, we had begun installing them. We'd finished one room and were on to the second, which was directly beside it in the hall. As we worked, we began to hear loud crashing sounds from the completed room. Obviously, I got up to see, since we were among the only people on campus. Just as I was about to duck into the room to see what was going on, a desktop came flying by the door, narrowly missing me. It crashed against the wall with an ear-shattering thud, 
its side panel coming off and a few of the internals spilling out onto the floor. At that point, the rest of my team came in and saw the PC in pieces. We entered the room, only to find the majority of the lab machines in similar states, damaged and strewn about. It seemed impossible. These were public classrooms, and so each station was secured to a cage built into a desk with a padlock. There was simply no way the amount of damage could have occurred, let alone in that short of a time. Nobody was in the room when we filed in, but as if to tease us, the other entrance swung away. We heard footsteps and the telltale giggling of the ghost of, you guessed it, Mima. The fallout from that event was immense. Things were getting a little too corporeal for us. It was tense and uncomfortable. Beyond that, our bosses were furious. We had an emergency meeting arranged to discuss what had happened, but due to the lack of CCTV in the room, we were unable to prove our side of things. We almost all got terminated that day and were barred from any extra shifts. Following that incident, I had a very bizarre dream. I remember it vividly. I was standing on a subway platform. It was empty save me and Mima. In my hands, I held an old camera. She stood at the edge of the platform, looking at me and smiling. She'd do little things with her hands and make cute gestures as I photographed her. Then maybe a minute later, the light of a train became apparent. It was loud, barreling down the tunnel. I remember lowering the camera, watching as Mima waved at me once more. And just as the train neared, she stepped backwards, falling into the space of the tracks and getting hit by the train. As the vehicle passed, I looked down, finding in my hand a photograph, but not one I'd taken, the one from the room instead, where we'd first seen her, captioned, Rest in Peace, Mima with a frown occupying her face instead of a smile. When I woke up, I was covered in sweat. I checked my phone and it read 4 a.m. I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. As I lay there thinking about the photograph, I had an epiphany. I really can't describe it properly, but something inside me knew what I had to do. I waited patiently for a few hours, up until the first bus that followed the road alongside my college would run. Then I made my way to the station and got on. I didn't have a shift, and following the events of the day previous, I really shouldn't have went to the campus. But I did. I had to. As soon as I stepped off the bus, this cold sensation came over me. Granted, the morning air was chilly, but this was different. It prickled my skin the farther I went, but I ignored it. I headed directly towards my old favorite lunch spot, Mima's room. I still had my ID card, and so I was able to unlock the access door of the building, then make my way up to the floor the room was on. I stood before it. The air around me, despite being conditioned, was horrendously tense and thick, almost like I was moving through water. But I continued. I swiped my card. The door showed green and unlocked without issue. Then I stepped inside. It was normal. The lights came on fine, and I moved to the back of the room. As gracefully as I could, I moved, though every fiber of my being told me that there was something inside the room, something I couldn't see, watching me. But I kept going. I climbed up the desk, then onto the thin ledge that ran against the wall, and I reached up as far as I could, just barely managing to grab the edge of the frame. I pulled it down. The photo was different, just like my dream. Mima wore a soft frown, looking upset. The palpable sensation that someone was right behind me as I balanced on the ledge was nearly impossible to ignore, but I did manage to ignore it. As genuinely as I could, I blew the little bit of the dust off the photo, before whispering a quiet, Sorry, Mima. Then I strained myself as far as I could and carefully put the photograph back how it was before we'd ever touched it, face up, standing tall. As I let the frame go, the sensation of something behind me vanished. It was like a weight being lifted. Within seconds, everything about the room felt fine, natural, normal. I climbed down, looking once more back at where I put the photograph, before leaving and making my way out of the campus. When I arrived home, I vaguely remember collapsing into bed and sleeping well into the afternoon. 
Following that day, the ghost of Mima was never heard from again. The scribblings we had seen on the wall vanished, as did the cute origami figures. I never heard a giggle, or footsteps, or caught her in the corner of my eye on my night shifts. I never explained to my co-workers what I'd done either, and though we were all disappointed in the loss of the novelty, I think the relief we felt from knowing we'd never have to deal with her again was a fair trade. To this day, I don't know who Mima was, or why her photograph sat there, but I did visit it a few times after hours up until I left the college, and, believe it or not, her smile had returned. I suppose the photograph served as a memorial, or an ode, one that should never have been disrespected as it was, but I guess I'll never know for sure. Service call I'll never forget. From Sleepy HVAC Guy. This happened to me around six to seven years ago, and when I think about it, it feels like it just happened yesterday. I'll never forget that day. I'm an HVAC service technician, and for those who don't know, it's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. It's good trade work. With this kind of work, if you do residential housing, it isn't uncommon for homeowners to leave the door unlocked for you to go fix whatever isn't working when they're not home during the day. At least, that's how it is in the smaller town I live in. I received a work order one day to schedule a visit with an older lady for a furnace checkup. Usually, they request service and I call to set up a time and date to come do the work. So I did just that. I called, and she asked if I could come the next morning at 8. I agreed, and she said, I'll leave the back door unlocked. Just let yourself in. The stairs are right at the back door. Just head down them, and the first door on your right is where the furnace is. I replied, Sounds good. I'll let you know if I find any issues. She then spoke back, That sounds wonderful, thank you. Also, I haven't decided if I'm going to sleep in tomorrow or going to work early. I'm leaving for a vacation. A vacation? Sounds like fun. Well, I'll try to be quiet when I come in so I don't wake you if you're sleeping in then. She thanked me, and we said our goodbyes. The next morning, I was up at the usual time, making myself some coffee, then jumping into the truck, going on my way. It was a cool fall day, and the morning was darkened with rain clouds. My favorite weather. I pulled up to the house in the work order. It was a small white home, older for sure, with red shutters and a tall seven-foot white wooden fence around the back of the property. I grabbed my bag out of the back. Sipping my coffee, I started walking to the side of the house to the gate. I let myself in and walked up the stairs to the back door. I glanced over to her detached garage and through the window I saw a vehicle parked inside. I looked inside quickly to see if there were any signs of the homeowner. It was dark inside, all the lights were off, so I opened the door, went inside, and closed it behind me. In this house, when you walk into the back door, the stairs are straight ahead, and to the right it opens up into a kitchen. Well, I peeked around the right side and looked down past the kitchen into the living room. I thought to myself, she must be asleep still, hence the vehicle and the lights being off. I turned the basement stair lights on and went down the stairs to the furnace room. I unpacked my bag for the tools I needed and began to open the furnace up to run it and test the things I needed to. We use a little plastic key to close the furnace switch so the fan will run while the door is off. It makes some noise, but it usually isn't too loud while it runs. A few seconds after the furnace started, my ears perked up. I heard something above me. Footsteps. They were coming from where the bedrooms would be, off to my right walking over me to the kitchen. I didn't think much of it. I just felt bad I may have been making too much noise and woke up our customer. A few moments went by and I heard the footsteps go back to the bedroom. I was getting close to the end of what I needed to do there, when all of a sudden I heard a thud, thud, thud. I nearly jumped up from my crouched position. What the hell was that? I thought to myself. It was stomping. Someone was stomping from the bedroom to the kitchen. I felt some slight panic, 
because I thought I kept her awake with the noise and she was upset with me. The stomping stopped briefly in the kitchen above me, and I just stared at the floor above me waiting. The few moments I waited felt like an eternity then. Thud, thud, thud. The stomping footsteps trailed back away to the bedroom. I remembered thinking, I better pack up and split before I have an uncomfortable confrontation with the homeowner. I put the covers back on the furnace, threw my tools in my bag, and my phone in my pocket. I stood up, taking a few steps and looking around the corner. I saw the light to the stairs was off. I paused a moment before walking out of the room and thought to myself, I'm pretty sure I turned that on. But before I could contemplate any more to myself, thud, thud, thud. The footsteps were even louder than before like someone was running from one end of the house to the other and stopped right above me. I started to get some anxiety, knowing someone was there, waiting. It felt as if I waited an eternity to hear something, anything. So I took a deep breath, and I thought, well, if she's angry, I'll just have to deal with it and be extra nice. I took a few steps. I was looking down at the floor then, and I could see the bottom of the steps from there. I peered up, and in the darkness of the stairs at the top was the silhouette of a head of someone with long hair dangling down over their face and shoulders. What little light from the door there was behind the head cast a shadow over their face. I couldn't make out any features. It was just an arm and head, like someone was leaning around the corner looking down at me. Panic set in, I froze. I locked eyes on this person for what felt like forever. Eventually, I had to blink. And when I did, they vanished. I blinked a few more times and tried to clear my eyes. I waited and prayed they would go back the other way so I could just leave. I wondered what in the world was that about. A few seconds passed and the footsteps thudded back to the bedroom. Dead silence fell over the house. All I could hear was the blood pumping and ringing in my ears. Finally, I decided to push myself and just go. My legs felt they were made of solid metal, stiff and heavy. I then broke into a sprint up the stairs. My spine chilled as I ran. My ears heard them coming. Thud, thud, thud. It was coming towards me. Full adrenaline was pumping now. I charged up the stairs, pushing myself. I got to the top, and as I opened the door and slammed it behind me, I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye. I tried to catch my breath. I turned around, and through the small glass opening at the top of the door, I saw a shadow of a person standing in the kitchen. I didn't freeze this time. I nearly fell down the steps getting away. I went down the path through the gate, back to my truck, I threw my bag in the back, and I jumped in. I tried to make sense of what just happened. My heart was beating out of my chest. Trying to calm myself down, I put it in drive and was gone. I drove a few blocks up to a gas station to get a fresh coffee, trying to relax before calling the homeowner. I calmed myself first, then made the call. Here's how the conversation went. Uh, hello? I'm all finished. Everything looks good. I'm sorry if I woke you up. Oh, no worries. You didn't wake me. I went into work early. Oh, I see. I saw a car in the garage. I thought I heard some footsteps above me, too. Must have been my mind playing tricks. She paused a moment before responding, then said, Oh, yes. My house is old can make some funny noises. I rode with a co-worker today. Oh, I see. Well, I'll see you in the spring for that maintenance. Her response came quickly, and she cut me off at the end of my sentence, simply asking, Did you see it too? It's not there. From Jonah R., 
Between 1999 and 2006, I served my community as a detention deputy. As you might imagine, I have a lot of stories. Most of them neither fun nor funny. But there were a couple that were downright terrifying. I decided to become a jail guard when it was announced a jail would be opening up in my hometown. After I left the service, I had only had a couple of part-time jobs, not anything one would consider a career. During this time, I met a beautiful woman who agreed to become my wife. Working for tips as a waiter was not going to cut it anymore. So away I went to college to earn the right to wear a badge. Once I finished my training, I was off to jail, thankfully on the right side of the bars. When the new jail neared completion, the higher-ups decided to have a deputy stationed there to keep an eye on the place. If I could get that assignment, I'd get to work unsupervised and be five minutes away from my house. I couldn't raise my hand fast enough. Now that I think back on it, I wish I'd kept my hand down. The main part of the jail is laid out like a V, with dorms consistently placed on either side of the V and Master Control was located at the base of the V. Master Control is just what it sounds like. It's the room where primary access control is handled. After checking everything was in place, I settled in for the night. I had snacks, soda, a new book I was looking forward to reading. Keep in mind this was before the iPhone Wi-Fi era. Other than being bored to tears, I didn't have anything to worry about. Or so I thought. We were required to walk down the corridors and into each of the dorms every few hours. I never liked walking down the main corridors. All that empty space was unnerving. I know it's super cliche, but I always got the feeling someone was sitting up in the master control watching me walk around. It felt like someone back there was watching over me. Someone who wasn't actually there. I brushed it off, manned up, and did my rounds. One night I was halfway down the first corridor when I realized I hadn't unlocked the doors before I'd left master control. I groaned. That meant I'd have to unlock all the doors manually. Pop. The door to my left creaked open. Inside I could hear the doors to each of the two dorms also open. What in the world? I thought. It was a new facility and there were bound to be a few bugs so I double-checked to make sure I had the master keys in my pocket before heading in to shut the inner doors and closing the main hallway door. It would have been kind of embarrassing if I locked myself in, especially for 12 hours. Checked and secured, I moved on. Pop. Pop. This time it was the primary doors on both sides of the hallway. Just as they had before, the doors in front of me began to open. If something happens once, you can just blow it off, but if something happens twice, at exactly the precise time you're about to do something, that is not a coincidence. Meanwhile, I still felt those non-existent eyes crawling up the back of my neck. Working in law enforcement, in any capacity, can be a soul-sucking experience. You get used to ugly and scary, but this was a different kind of scary. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Like I said, the first time it happened, it was relatively easy to shake off. I figured they were using some sort of new motion-sensitive system or something. I called my supervisor the next day, asking him if that happened to be the case. Nah, no way, man. We'd never use something like that. After making it clear that was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard, Think about having a motion-sensitive system in a jail for a minute. He asked me why I was asking. I made up something about noticing some equipment in the control rooms and wanting to know what they were. He scoffed. You've taken the courses on how to operate those systems. Heck, you know more about how things work down there than I do. I could feel the sarcasm pouring out of the phone. He could give me crap all he wanted so long as he saved me that 45-minute drive. The following night, I decided to wait a while before doing my rounds. I paid extra close attention to the CCTV cameras. This was back in the early 2000s and I was with a county agency. 
so we're not talking NSA level tech here. I watched and watched and after a while I finally cracked my book open. But then the doors began opening again. I couldn't hear them opening. I first noticed it when I saw motion on the screens. My head yanked up to the sight of three doors slowly opening. I steeled myself, grabbing my keys and going down to close those doors. But things were different this time. Instead of just feeling someone watching me, I swear I saw movement in master control when I glanced back over my shoulder. Racing back, I was greeted to the sight of an empty room filled with mindlessly flickering screens. That day, keep in mind I worked 12-hour shifts at night, I dreamt I was in one of the dorms and I had a ring full of keys, but none of them would open any of the doors. Then the dream went on what I could only call endless desperation loop. I kept trying to get out using the keys, any of the keys, but none of them would open any of the doors. I was starting to get rattled. These sorts of events kept happening. As the day of the jail's opening drew closer, I started to believe there was someone living in that jail. Maybe a homeless person, desperate for a place to stay, had taken up residence there. But no matter how hard I searched, I could not find anyone. Finally, my time watching over the creepy place drew to a close. My last day, or rather my last night, finally came around. The sun began to warm the skies off in the horizon, and I could see the lights from the relief officer's car as he pulled into the parking lot. It's not there. The words had come out of nowhere and had been spoken directly into my ear. I jumped up, causing the chair to fly across the room. I rushed around, checking every screen of every monitor in the room. Nothing. So, uh, what's going on? The oncoming officer asked me as he entered the room. I sighed. Nothing. I said, packing up my things and heading out. When you leave the control room, the entryway to the two main hallways is on the left, and the main exit is on the right. As there weren't any inmates in the facility yet, we left the hallway door open. As I stepped out, I stopped for a second to adjust the strap on my backpack. As I turned to leave, I heard someone say, It's not there. The words echoed down the halls. I quickly turned and looked up at the other officer to find him frantically looking over the monitors, down toward me and down the hallways. I didn't know if the other officers were playing a game on me, and the guy who just took over was in on it. So rather than get punked, I just gave him a wave and headed out. Whatever was going on, at least I knew it wasn't just me. Soon the jail was stocked full of alleged evildoers and you couldn't hear yourself think, let alone some ethereal convict trying to find something he lost. Not long after that, I resigned, taking up a job with another sheriff's office. That was 20 plus years ago, but even after all that time, I still think back on those days and shudder. Ghost at Chuck E. Cheese From Jazzy J I graduated from a Christian school and I was 18, so I needed a job to pay for college. One of the seniors I graduated with recommended I work at Chuck E. Cheese, which is where he worked. I was accepted pretty quickly, and just as quickly I realized how stressful the job was. I worked as a game room attendant. I was the one that customers called for when they needed tokens, cleaned tables, delivered pizzas, and helped little kids find their mom or dad. It was fine at first when I had help, but as soon as I began to settle in, I was the only game room attendant for the closing shift. During the closing shift, half of the restaurant is already turned off. The games are as well, except one, The Haunted Mansion. I was told about that game, that it would sometimes turn on during the night while being connected to no power. I paid that no mind, I didn't want to assume the worst. Being part of a family that was raised Christian, 
I was taught to ignore the paranormal as to not catch any attention from it. During one shift, I was the only one in the game room area, cleaning the tables near the cashier, where the last lights were on. Did you turn off the games? One of the girl cashiers, D, asked. I turned to her, then back at the darkness and scanned the area. The games are all connected to one power source, I explained. If one's on, all of them are going to be on. Well, I swear I saw a light flashing or something. Maybe it was just a car passing by. She calmed herself as she continued her mopping. Another female cashier, A, grinned as she came over. Maybe it was Angie's ghost. At this, D flinched and glared at her. Don't say that. I watched them for a bit, confused about this Angie's ghost. But I decided not to bother and went on with my duties. At Chuck E. Cheese, every employee must be Chuck E. This is done every hour or so of the day. A small broom closet is where employees went to change into the costume. The inside of it smelled really bad. And in the closet, there was a door at the back wall, which was locked. You could peek in through the top, since the small wooden door was shorter than the actual frame. But it was dark, and you could see the sunlight from the other door also peeking in on the other side. This is where it began to get weird. I dreaded going into that closet. It wasn't just because the costume smelled like vomit, but the darkness in that room behind the closet never felt, well, empty. Every time I changed, I felt someone staring at me, shooting daggers at my back as I put on the costume, and I never dared to look back, because when I did, there would be nothing but a small silhouette of a head showing up to break the light coming from the other door. But I knew no one was there, which terrified me more as I tried to ignore it. While closing, I was always the last one to leave, along with my manager who just stayed in the office but I was the only one outside, alone in the darkness. I would always put on my headphones, listening to music as I cleaned, but I could never have both of them in. I always had just one earbud in, because every time I put in both, the feeling of being watched enveloped me, and even worse, it felt as if someone was always walking up to me. The bathrooms were taken care of by the cashiers. I never went to the restroom because I was always needed by a customer or by my manager. But one opening shift made me 100% sure that what I was feeling and sensing was not in my head, and I would never use that restroom ever again. On the day of that opening shift, there was a blackout. We had to sit out in the front tables near the windows, so as not to trip in the semi-darkness of the building. My female manager kept saying she wanted to go into the dark office for the phone, to call and see what's going on. Don't do it or else Angie's ghost will get you. A would call out to her as the manager ran into the darkness. That's when I decided to ask her about it. Who is Angie? What ghost? A looked over at me with a wide expression. You haven't felt it. There's a ghost here. It was brought here by an old employee named Angie. The cook looked over with fear and shushed her. Shh, don't talk about her. I've had enough of her. One time I walked out to take out the trash, and when I turned to look back at the door, there was a flash of black hair. Then a hand grabbed the door and shut it. It was locked, too. He exclaimed. I had to run to the front and have Dee unlock the door to let me in, and we checked the cameras. Nothing but static. Soon, the lights to the building turned back on. Everyone returned to their normal places. But... I had a bad feeling in my chest after that story. I felt like something was going to happen. I just didn't know what, and the feeling of being watched wasn't helping at all. And to my horror, I needed to use the restroom. After a long time hesitating, I went. I didn't like the restroom there. It felt off, and the cashiers would tell me strange things happened in the girls' restroom. I ran in and I took the last stall out of the four. The feeling of being watched was even worse. I felt my heart pounding out of my chest as I finished up. Once I was done, I went towards the sink to wash my hands, but as I approached the sink, I noticed the first stall, which was closed when I walked in, was now wide open, 
and there was someone inside. There was a little girl with long black hair covering her face. She was in a white dress. My skin crawled as I saw her. As ashamed as I am to say this, I was so afraid I left without washing my hands. I didn't want to be in that restroom any longer. And before anyone tries to debunk this, we hadn't opened to anyone yet, so it wasn't a customer. And the only girls there at the time were me, A, and the manager, who were at the front counting the registers for the day. So I knew at that moment, that was Angie's ghost, the one I'd heard so much about, and she did not like me. I told my parents about this, and immediately they told me to ignore it. They told me to pray before I walked into work and to listen to Christian music while I cleaned. Once I began doing this, I would feel a bubble surrounding me, like a shield, and I would still feel her watching me from a distance, even walking around the bubble, looking for a way to get closer to me. But she never could, and for a while, I stopped feeling her near me. On my last week of working there, we had a full house. I was so busy stocking tickets and tokens that I had to be pulled aside by a dad needing some assistance with a particular photo booth. This photo booth was a little red car with Chucky sitting in the passenger seat, and the driver's seat is where the kids would sit and take their pictures. Once a picture was taken, it would print out on the side of the engine of the car. So yeah, our pictures aren't coming out. Could you help us? The dad asked me. I quickly followed the dad to the machine. His little girl had blonde hair and two pigtails with a bright yellow dress. I said hello before kneeling down to the printer part of the booth. Once I opened it up, I saw her photo stuck inside. I pulled it out, but I could feel that there were more photos jammed up behind it. I assumed they were also hers and handed the three photos to the dad. I started closing up the machine when the dad spoke again. Hey, uh, these pictures aren't my daughter's. I looked up at him as he handed me two photos back. The first one's mine, but the last two aren't. They look kind of creepy, don't they? He said. I looked at the photos, and my eyes watered. There, sitting at the driver's seat, where the camera takes the picture, was a little girl with black hair covering her eyes, wearing a white dress. The second photo was her holding the camera with skinny, pale arms. When I looked back up, the dad and his daughter were already at another game. I took the photos and ran to the kitchen to show the cook. Look, is this her? I yelled, rushing over to him and explaining everything that happened. His face went white. He nodded with wide eyes. He quickly showed the female manager, exclaiming that he was indeed telling her the truth. Once everyone took a look at those photos, we placed them in the small break room, which was just a small shelf and under it were hooks for people's bags and purses. I continued my duties for the night while telling my friend who guards the front entrance about the whole situation. She didn't get to see the photos and wanted to see them herself. I quickly went to the break room to obtain them, but... To my surprise, the pictures were not there. Hey, did you take the photos? I asked the cook. He turned to me and shook his head. No, why? Well, I wanted to show them to my friend, but they're not there. Did someone go into the break room and get them? I asked again. Everyone looked around the whole kitchen. No one ever saw those photos again. They were just gone. I've never had an experience like this, and I hope it's the last. To that ghost, I hope we never meet again. Ice cream, more like I scream, from Eden. My very first job was at a local ice cream and water ice store. Even though it's been more than 10 years, I'll never forget that job. I think I'd just turned 15 years old when I started. It was a seasonal job for the late spring and summer, which was perfect because I was in high school and tended to be busy in the fall doing theater productions. The place was a small ice cream shop located in a plaza with a local grocery store. 
It was the kind of ice cream shop where you would walk up to the window to order. There was no inside area for customers, just a few wooden benches outside the window to sit and eat your frozen treats. Since it was a small place, there weren't many employees. When I was hired, there was myself, three other girls about my age, a manager who was a little older than me, and the owner. The first summer I worked there, it was mainly myself and the owner there alone. Usually, I worked the opening shift 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The owner at the time was a guy in his early to mid-30s. He usually stayed in the office, meaning it was just me up front with the customers. I had no problem with this. I would bring a boombox, yes, a boombox. It was the early 2000s after all and I would play my favorite Broadway CDs or Disney classics to sing along to between customers. Honestly, I enjoyed working there, and I didn't notice anything weird about my workplace. That is, until I worked my first closing shift. It was midsummer, and one of the girls who usually worked the night shift had called out of work on a Saturday. We were usually quite busy on a Saturday night as the plaza was located directly across from a skate park that was the popular teen hangout in the small town. Really, you either hung out at the skate park or in the parking lot of the plaza. Anyway, they were expecting a big crowd, so of course I was called in for the 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift. Instead of being there with the owner, I would be there with the manager. We'll call her Sarah. Sarah was maybe two years older than me. I'd seen her around the store from time to time, but I'd never worked directly with her. Truthfully, I was a little nervous because I found it was hard for me to get along with other girls. Plus, I had just moved to this town earlier in the year after growing up in a big city, and I didn't have many friends. I quickly realized I had nothing to worry about. Sarah was so cool. That's literally the only way I could describe her. She had a nose ring, which wasn't popular back then, a bunch of ear piercings, brown hair with bright red tips, and even a tattoo. We bonded pretty quickly, within the first hour or two of the shift. She told me about wanting to go to college for criminology, and talked about her fascination with serial killers and true crime. Before long, the shop was pretty crowded, as most Saturdays were. However, as it got darker, the customers dwindled. The small town had a curfew for teenagers. They couldn't be out in the streets or parks past 10 p.m., so oftentimes, they would leave early to go hang out at someone's house, or something like that. The ice cream shop closed at 9 p.m., and that gave the closing crew an hour to clean and lock up. Having never worked a closing shift before, at some point during the shift, Sarah gave me a rundown of what we needed to do to get out on time. When we closed, I went to the back to retrieve the broom so that I could start to sweep. Now, the inside of the store was set up like this. First, there was the storefront, with the horizontal freezers that contained the tubs of water ice, the soft serve ice cream machines, milkshake blenders, soft pretzel display, topping display, and windows for customers to order from. Secondly was the back area, where we had the walk-in freezer, large fridge, pretzel oven, microwave, and water ice making machines. There was a glass side door there that led to the outside. And thirdly, we had the back hallways, two hallways that connected to the back area. One led to the small bathroom in the office, and the other led to the back door that went outside to where the dumpsters were. The one that led to the back door is where all the brooms, mops, and cleaning supplies were kept. That's where I went. The brooms were hanging on the wall by these tight clips you had to undo to get them down. As I made my way down the hallway, I watched as one of the brooms slowly unclipped itself. It was now in the air in front of me, and it stayed there for a few seconds before finally falling to the ground. The handle lay closest to me. I had watched it happen with wide eyes. I didn't even know what to do. It took me a minute, but I grabbed the broom and booked it to the store front. Sarah was there putting lids on the tubs of water ice. She noticed that I was out of breath. You all right? She asked. I, the broom, it, I panted. It unclipped itself. Sarah finished my sentence. We stared at each other, making eye contact for a few seconds. Look, she sighed. This kind of thing happens a lot here during the night shift. I can tell you more about it, but we should finish cleaning first. All I could do was nod. We sped through the cleaning. I'd always been good at cleaning during the day, and this was not really all that different. At the end of cleaning, we gathered all the trash bags and put them in the hallway near the back door. Then we turned off all the lights. 
The last thing that needed to be done was count up the registers. That was something I didn't have any experience with, so Sarah invited me into the back office with her so that I could see how it was done. Sarah sat at the wooden desk in a black computer chair, and I sat on a metal folding chair in the corner of the office. I couldn't help but glance up at the screens on the upper part of the desk that showed the camera feed. One camera was on the storefront, and the other two were in the back area pointed down both hallways. It wasn't great quality, but I could see Sarah and I inside the office door on the camera because the light was on. She laid the trays from the register out in front of herself, then she opened the big black safe next to the desk. As she started counting up the trays, she let out a deep breath. All right, she said. I assume you still want to know about what goes on here. I gulped, but nodded. Sarah bit her lip for a second. She peeked outside of the office, then slowly closed the door, locking it with the simple doorknob lock. A few years ago, this was a different ice cream shop, she began to say in a quiet voice. You wouldn't have known that since you're new in town, but it was owned by an older man and lady who had a son. The son worked as a manager here, and when he was 21, his parents found him in this very office. He had put a gun inside his mouth and pulled the trigger. He killed himself right here in this office. I felt my heart racing in my chest. So what you're saying is that the ice cream shop is haunted by that guy? Sarah slowly nodded. Usually he tries to help, like when the brooms come flying off the walls, but sometimes he likes to pull pranks on us. What do you mean by pranks? I asked. Well, Sarah started but then stopped. She was staring at the camera screens, eyes wide. I looked up and my eyes got wide as well. The camera, which pointed down the other hallway, was capturing a dark, shadowy figure of a man, which was illuminated by the red exit sign above the back door. Like that, Sarah said. That's the door we have to go out later. When I blinked, the figure was gone. Before I could really process what was happening, there was a loud knock on the office door. Sarah and I were both startled and yelped. The doorknob began to twist and turn, but it was locked, so it wasn't going to open. I'm trying to count the registers, Sarah said. We're almost done. The doorknob stopped twisting. It must be getting closer to ten, she said quietly to me. Sarah quickly began to count the register trays again. As soon as she got them counted, she shoved the money in the safe and closed it. Come on, let's try to get out quick, she said. What'll we do if he's out there? I asked. He won't be, you know, probably. She flung open the office door. I clung to her arm as we made our way over to the side door. Sarah made sure it was locked. Then we went to the trash bags on the floor. We both grabbed as many as we could. We did not want to have to make a second trip. Then, we booked it down the hallway and ran out the back door. I dropped the bags when I got outside and sunk down to the pavement. I glanced around, realizing we were in the back alley behind the plaza. There was a big green dumpster in front of me. Never had I been so glad to be in a creepy back alleyway. I let out a sigh of relief. Sorry, he's usually not so active. It must be because you're new, Sarah said placing the trash bags one by one in the dumpster. To be honest, this had not been the first experience I'd ever had with a ghost. The house I'd grown up in, in the city, was old and it was haunted. But since moving to this small town, I'd finally got some peace. A break from any ghosts until now. I never really expected to see something like that at the ice cream shop I worked at. As the summer went on, I worked only a few other night shifts with Sarah. Most of them were relatively quiet, just small things here and there, like brooms unclipping or mop buckets rolling around. Eventually, fall came around and the ice cream shop closed for the season. By the time the next summer had come around, I was already invited back to the ice cream shop. That summer, I was going to be made a manager. Sarah chose not to return. She wanted that summer to herself before college. She had been accepted to a really good school in Washington, D.C. to study criminology. So, I would take over the position. This meant I'd be working the night shift a lot more. To be honest, at first, it wasn't that bad. A close friend of mine, who we'll call Marie, 
started working at the ice cream shop too. Most night shifts, it was me and her. Now, there were some times I'd be asked to work double shifts, both opening and closing the store. Yeah, I was a miner working way more hours than I should have, but it was a small ice cream shop and no one cared in the early 2000s. One day, I'd been at the ice cream shop all day. It had been raining the whole afternoon. Rain means slow business for an ice cream shop. Usually, only one girl would work all day and night when it rains. Since I was the manager now, I was that girl. Begrudgingly, I called Marie on the corded landline phone and told her she didn't need to come in that night. After giving her the night off, I plugged in my boombox and got to work. Believe it or not, I had a lot of responsibilities as a manager, even though I was young. One of my many tasks was to take care of the ice buildup on the insides of the horizontal freezers. Once a week, I'd have to remove the tubs of water ice and use a metal scraper to remove all the ice that built up on the inner walls of the freezer. I had begun to scrape the freezer when I heard a noise in the back. I sighed. I didn't want to investigate, but I knew it would be better if I did, so I put the metal scraper down and walked into the back area. I could already see that the broom was lying on the floor in the hallway near the back door. I picked up the broom. Yeah, I know, I said out loud. I'm gonna sweep, but I have to finish the freezer. I took the broom up front with me. I placed it, leaning against the ice cream machine, and bent over the horizontal freezer again. I stopped and stared. On the wall of the freezer, there was a large handprint, way too big to be my hand. As I stared at it, the boombox began skipping. I blinked quickly. Grabbing the scraper, I scraped away the handprint. Then I went to the back and I slapped the boombox, trying to get it to stop skipping. But it wouldn't stop so I had to unplug it. I tried not to think about it or say anything about it as the rain picked up and was now loudly hitting the roof of the ice cream store. But I had decided I would be calling Marie again. I took out my cell phone, I think it was one of those early androids with the touchscreen, and I called Marie. Luckily, she agreed to come in, even after I had given her the night off. She lived close by and walked over as soon as she could. I was so grateful for her company. Now that she could watch the storefront, I could complete most of my management responsibilities. The rest of the evening was quiet. Honestly, a little too quiet, considering what had happened earlier. When it came time to close up shop, we went about doing the closing tasks. Marie lifted a tub of extra water ice to put it in the walk-in freezer, then went into the back as I began to clean the ice cream machine. About 10 minutes went by, and I realized I hadn't seen Marie in a bit. I went into the back to check on her. I couldn't find her in the bathroom, the office, or in the other hallway near the cleaning supplies. Marie? I called loudly. As soon as I said her name, there was a pounding on the walk-in freezer door. I rushed over and opened it. Marie practically fell out of the freezer. She said, Sorry, I, I didn't know the freezer locked. She was shivering. I must have looked freaked out, because she started to look freaked out. What? She asked me. The freezer does lock, I started, but it locks from the inside. I stepped inside the freezer and showed her how it locked from the inside. I believe this was so, if the ice cream store was robbed, you could take shelter in the freezer and lock it from the inside. I don't know for sure, but that's what I always assumed. I, I swear though, Marie told me. I, I couldn't open the door. I really couldn't. I believe you, I assured her. Then I sighed. This kind of thing happens a lot here during the night shift. I can tell you more about it, but we should finish cleaning first. I quoted Sarah exactly. Since I was the manager now, the responsibility of explaining the history of the ice cream shop had fallen upon me. I ended up working for that ice cream shop for a total of six summers as a manager. Today, that ice cream shop is a different business completely. When I still lived in that area, I would always pass by and wonder if he was still there. Curious Dark Figure From Anonymous I'm a security officer in the Milwaukee area, and I've been at my current posting for a few months, working the night shifts. 
The business, I guess I could say, is a hotel for the sick and their families. It's newly built and less than a year old at the time of writing this. It has two floors with windows lining every wall. It's a very nice property to say the least. As the security officer at this business, I was tasked with monitoring cameras and every so often patrol the property to make sure everything is locked and no one is loitering on the property. There's only one security officer for each shift. When I first began the posting at the end of summer 2021, everything was going on as normal and the nights were quiet. This continued for a few weeks, but around week three, I began getting the sense that I was not alone and I had the feeling of being watched. Perhaps I was just tired from long days of work, so I just chalked it up to me seeing things. So I continued my shifts as normal, until one day I started to see a dark figure out of the corner of my eye. When I looked up, the dark figure quickly moved behind one of the pillars. I stared for a while and even got up to take a look around the pillar, but nothing was there. I continued to monitor the cameras, reading a book, when I suddenly heard two taps on the window behind me. Not in quick succession, but about two to three seconds apart. They were not by any means light taps. It was more like a thud, like someone was trying to get my attention. I took out my flashlight as the lights were all off. I looked around, but I didn't find anything out of the ordinary. So I sat back down at my desk, going back to my business as normal. I know in hindsight, I should have investigated more, but at the time I could not explain why it was happening, although the thought did linger in the back of my mind. When the time came, I began my rounds, and while walking down the southwest corridor of the building, I got the feeling of being watched again, and like any normal human being, I looked around. There wasn't anything in front of me, so I looked over my shoulder and my heart dropped. A dark figure slowly moved behind a doorway and disappeared. Was it just a shadow of a passing car? I thought to myself. My heart was definitely racing at this point, but I continued to walk down the hallway, occasionally looking over my shoulder. At the end of the hall are a set of windows before leading downstairs, and because it was dark outside, the window reflected like a mirror. About halfway down the hallway, I looked up at the window and see what looks to be a head sitting above my right shoulder. I immediately turned around, ready to confront someone, and again, no one was there. My heart was pounding, and I almost didn't want to continue my rounds, but I had to. It was my job. I know you're going to say I should have noped out of there, but I kept telling myself this can't be real. I must be so tired I'm just seeing things. The whole time I felt like I was being watched and the hair was standing up on my neck like they were going to pop out of the pores. While on the lower level, I had to use the restroom before continuing on. After I finished my business, I washed my hands and while I turned the water off, I could have sworn I heard footsteps outside the door. I opened the door and I looked in the lounge area and down the corridor, but nothing. If there was someone there, I would have seen them. Again, I thought I was just hearing and seeing things because I was getting tired. I walk not even 15 feet towards the northwest corridor and the soap dispenser goes off twice in the bathroom adjacent to the one I just used. Having just walked past it, I knew there was no one in there. I thought to myself, my shadow must have caused the motion sensor to go off. There is a light in the hall there, but again I shake my head and continue to walk on. My rounds include going outside, to which I felt a great relief when I walked out. I continued my normal route around the building. I was getting close to the garage, and I couldn't believe it. I looked up at one of the windows in the offices, and the outline of a dark figure was just standing there, looking down at me. I quickly shined my flashlight up at the window, but by then it was gone. 
My anxiety was through the roof now. I went inside and sat at the desk, refusing to move and do my rounds. Only until people started moving about when the sun came up did I gain back my composure somewhat. The staff of the building began to arrive later in the morning, dropping their belongings in the office. One of them came up and asked how the night went, to which I replied, it was all right, and I explained that it felt as if I was seeing things. The thing I didn't want to hear next was what she said. Yeah, we're thinking this place is haunted. There have been some weird happenings going on in the building, and I think it might be because the business across the street is trying to expand, and they found out they were digging up a burial ground. Maybe the disturbed spirits came over here. Just hearing those words made the sense of dread reign over me, because now I knew I was more than likely being stalked or watched by something. I began to explain to her about what I'd experienced overnight, and she had a very shocked and disturbed look on her face. After I left for the day, I spoke to the other security officers, and they too have experienced similar sightings, that feeling of being watched. However, each of them has said they haven't experienced anything other than that. One of the security officers that work there almost refuses to come back. It's been three months now, and on occasion I'll get the feeling of being watched, hear footsteps along the hallway, and I'll see a dark figure. But nothing else has come of it. After a while, I began to lose that sense of being scared, and figured it must be a friendly spirit if there is one but I still get that anxiety of being watched, with the hair rising on the back of my neck. I'm hoping this is just a curious ghost, and not something more. If something more sinister does happen, I'm not too sure I'm going to keep working here. The Shadow Man from Jack Mustard in the spring of 2011, when I began working as a security guard at a major tech company, one of the other officers made a remark to me before he left the building. Don't let any odd sounds get to you, he said. I told him most sites have unusual noises and they don't really bother me. I'm unlikely to encounter anything of a supernatural nature here, I said. Oh, I don't know about that, he replied. Being constructed in 2001 with its data center and telecoms, the tech company's site had the look and feel of something off a Star Wars set. It was a new high-tech structure with no history and no known tragedy. Besides me, the only energy there was computer energy. For nearly the first three years of my job, my initial assessment was proven correct. But there was one night in 2012 when I was reading a blog, I caught a glimpse out of the corner of my eye of a pitch black figure flashing across the second floor. Near the security desk is a large circular opening where one can see the walkway on the second floor. It looked like a robber dressed in black with a face mask, except it moved fast. It moved faster than any human could move. I brushed it off as nothing to be concerned about and continued to read my blog. I never mentioned it to anyone and I forgot about it. I didn't see it head on so it didn't really exist to me. It was a figment of my late night imagination. Fast forward about one year on the 3 a.m. patrol. I had an encounter far more real and chilling than the previous one. During the hourly patrols, the four telecom rooms and the data center have to be checked to ensure the computers do not overheat. To reach one of the telecom rooms, one has to traverse a dark corridor, which opens into a dimly lit office area. As I came out of the corridor, and my peripheral vision to my right, I saw a black, translucent figure. The figure stood approximately six feet tall. One could discern a head, neck, torso, and limbs, and it appeared to have short dreadlocks. I turned to look at it, and actually saw it straight on for about two seconds. It was black, faceless, but definitely real. 
I jumped backward and let out what seemed to be a loud yell. No one could hear me. The shadowy figure stepped back and blended itself into the background. The atmosphere lightened and returned to normal. Needless to say, the main lights went on and stayed on early that morning. When the security supervisor relieved me that morning, I asked him if any tragedies had occurred in the building or near the site. I considered him a reliable source to ask, as he had worked at the tech company since its opening. He said that no one had died on site, and he didn't remember anyone with short dreadlocks ever working there. Could something have happened prior to the construction of the building? Further research into the history of the place turned up nothing. To this day, I'm still uncertain as to who or what the mysterious shadow man or shadow men were. Funny Little Things at Work From Masai Riot My previous job was a ton of fun at first, but after a few years it was far from fun, with salary raises, company influence, and lack of work draining the whole work experience. There was a weird thing that happened during night shift when it was just me and Jeffrey, a former colleague of mine. We both agree to this day that it was something we shouldn't let out into the world, but that's a promise I'm breaking now. Jeffrey and I had the night shift from four in the afternoon until one at night, which I actually really loved, since I'm a night brewer, as we say in Holland. The day went by for the most part normally, and Jeffrey even got his dongle, a device that lets you watch things on a PC, so we could watch the soccer match of the world championships that year. There were no higher-ups during the night shifts, and I know that even though it's not legally allowed, we were okay with it. With 25 meter beams of steel, where we had to mill a lot of steel off of, sometimes up to 45 minutes, we had a lot of free time to check the match. As the match just finished, there was a truck coming with a few hauls that the company really needed for a few orders that needed to get out the next week. Jeffrey and I saw the lights going into the big flat area where we store our rails, the same ones used for railroads. Jeffrey said, uh, there shouldn't be a truck coming this late. I answered him, well, they haven't told me anything about it either, but I do know we need some rails for the upcoming orders. We looked at each other, but it was clear that we both didn't trust the whole situation. Jeffrey put a crowbar in his huge work pants, and I grabbed a big box cutter. We walked over to the truck. I was starting to trust the whole situation less and less. Jeffrey then spoke. Heads up. The driver of the truck stuck his head out and started to say something neither me nor Jeffrey understood, which made the two of us look at each other with weird faces. The moment I turned to the driver again, I saw a see-through pale face with a grin right next to the driver, and it startled me. Yo, dude, you okay? Jeffrey asked me, and after I collected myself, I just said, uh, Yeah, yeah, man, I'm okay. I then noticed Jeffrey had gripped the crowbar that was still in his work pants, but now the driver was talking English, so we finally understood him, even with his bad grasp of the English language. Jeffrey began to unload the truck with the forklift. I put a rail of 20 meters into the holders of the milling machine, locking it and starting the milling sequence. As I was holding my bathroom visit for over an hour, I really needed to go, so I went ahead to the bathroom. The driver was here as well, taking a leak, and so when I saw him in the bathroom, he began to make conversation. Hello, I have thing for boss of company, the driver said and after our bathroom visit, I walked with him to the truck. When we got there, he opened the door. The moment he did, Jeffrey honked the horn of the forklift, which startled me, causing Jeffrey to burst into laughter. And through the laughter, he could just get out the words, Oh man, that was good. Yeah, okay, you got me. Just unload everything, okay? I told him. The driver then handed me a box, and I looked at the driver weirdly. It was a shape more like a hexagon than a normal box. I walked to my boss's office. It was then that I noticed that the corridor to the boss's office seemed way darker than normal. At that moment, it was around 11 p.m. I quickly put down the hexagon box on my boss's table, but something didn't feel right to me, so I glanced back into the boss's office. 
and man, I wish I didn't. When I did, I saw the same face in the office that had been behind the driver before. I took a step back and frantically started blinking my eyes. When I stopped blinking, I didn't see that face anymore. I then slowly walked towards the cafeteria, which was only a few steps from the office, but I was a bit scared now, and I'd never been scared at this company before. Then I heard something fall in the office. Reluctantly, I started to walk back. I could still hear the noise of the forklift in the distance, so I knew it couldn't have been Jeffrey or the driver, because it was just me on this side of the building. I took a few steps inside. That's when I heard a voice. Someone said, Make me. That voice could not have been clearer. Terrified, I continued through the office. I looked around, not finding anything that would have caused that noise. But after a moment, I heard something else. Laughter. I looked all over rapidly again, and this time, I saw the face once more, over the hexagon box. The face looked to me with a serious expression. I kept staring at it, and it stared back at me, unblinking. Suddenly, Jeffrey tapped me on the shoulder, saying, Hey man, you okay? Surprised, I answered him. Let's call it a night, alright? Jeffrey looked at me with a weird look, but then he seemed to understand. Sure, let's call it a day. Jeffrey and I walked back to the machines, turning them all off. The entire time I felt that someone was watching me, and at one point I looked at the screen of the CPU linked to the milling machine. When the screen went black, I saw the face in the reflection. This really startled me. Jeffrey was running over towards me, but before he could even say anything, a loud thud boomed from the other part of the work floor. Jeffrey and I checked the surroundings of the work floor, but we couldn't find a thing, not until we saw on the far back. A huge 28 meter beam had fallen from the crane. How did that happen? I asked Jeffrey. But then he replied, him, and he pointed. I followed his finger, finding that familiar face, but this time I could also see a bit of the body of the figure. The face's expression became that of an eerie smile. Seeing this made my stomach turn. Jeffrey dragged me to the dressing room of the company, repeatedly shouting, We gotta go, we gotta go! As we ran, after finally getting our work clothes off, we ran towards our cars, and I looked up to the office of our boss, seeing that face again. This time I could see the top part of its body. I put the pedal to the metal when I was in my car, and I made it to the nearby Mickey D's to calm down. I ordered some food to relax. I then noticed my hand was shaking on the steering wheel. I gathered myself, then enjoyed my late night Mickey D's. The following day I was free from work, but since I'd left my phone charger there, I had to drive to the company to get it. When I parked my car, I saw the figure again in that window. I dreaded going back in the building, but I told myself I could do it. I went back inside, grabbed my charger, and when I looked back up, I saw a yellow eye almost right in my face. I think I passed out then. When I woke up, no one was around me, and I started to think of what this could be that caused me to faint. Later on, I would learn that my boss sold that hexagon thing. I never did learn what it was. And luckily, now I don't work there anymore. I do occasionally drive by, and every so often I swear I can see that face staring back at me. Still, I have no idea who or what it is, but I always saw it coming from my boss's office. I now work somewhere different, and I can only hope that my friends that still work there have been left alone by that thing. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com submit. As of April 14th, 
We're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com. <laughs>